You are listening to the bomb hole. Bomb hole podcast. It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. <laughs> the bomb hole. We're going to slide down in big hills. You know what I mean? On a big, nice burgundy snowboard. Okay, we are back in the booth here at the bomb hole, which is presented by Pub Beer and Liquid Death. Now, Stunny Buds, how we doing, Doug? So good, my dog. Uh, for the listeners, viewers, it, the summer's here. It's hot in the garage again. Yeah. And uh, we're probably going to be a couple of sweaty messes by the end of this episode. Now, to my left, we have Aaron Bittner. Bittner, what's going on? How are you? Doing well. How about you guys? Doing fantastic. We're doing great in the garage here today. Um, now, you're a professional snowboarder, have been for a long time, uh, film many parts in legendary videos such as Mac Dog, uh, your marquee pro for DC for a long time. Now, the arc of your career is very interesting to me. You you went from basically a relatively unknown snowboarder to filming for the biggest production company in less than two years. Now, can you kind of take us back to that time before you were known, before your finger on the trigger video parts, before you were kind of like the, the 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 formative years before you started filming for Tech Nine. Yeah, I mean, I grew up here in Salt Lake City, and been snowboarding since I was like seven or eight years old. But I grew up at Snowbird, so I didn't really get out of Little Cottonwood Canyon until I was early teens. Kind of would make it over to Brighton here and there. But it definitely seemed like back then, especially like the the snowboard scene was primarily kind of out of Brighton and that's where all the pros went. And, you know, we'd rarely see like big pros at Snowbird and stuff. And that's just where I grew up and where I was comfortable and spent most of my time riding Snowbird and had a good crew of friends that I'd ride with. And every once in a while we'd see like Bjorn, Eric, MFM, um, you know, some bird lokes that kind of made their way around there a bit. But, yeah, for the most part, just rode with with homies up there and rode the mountain and just learned how to snowboard at Snowbird. So a lot of just riding through choppy snow and and landing in crazy weird runouts and dropping cliffs and riding lines. And um, that was, that's kind of like where I started. And from there, we watched, watched tons of videos, watched like Finger on the Trigger movies, Mac Dog movies, of course, all the old Whitey movies, Kingpin Productions, and everybody hit handrails. So I didn't even know there was such a thing as a park, really, besides, like, seeing footage from Mount Hood and stuff like that. For the most part, we would just go and go hit a rail, go to rail gardens, or go find a handrail to hit, and that's how I learned to hit rails, was, like, actually going down to the city where there's some snow and go hit some rails and I think that was helpful for my career later on too because I didn't really get used to anything other than actually stepping up and hitting like a handrail so learned how to do that and when I got the opportunity to film or started filming with friends even it was like yeah kind of just felt ready to go and see what we could get done but yeah growing up at Snowbird and and hitting handrails was like really the foundation for or like my two sides of snowboarding really which is like either want to go hit jumps into pow or or go hit some rails in the city never got used to hitting park jumps or anything before then so riding pipe or park was just not my thing for a long time never really was but it's still fun to mess around so and try explain for the listener that maybe isn't familiar with snowbirds terrain and what the mountains like like it, it's a <clears> big <throat> mountain with long steep big runs right it's so so explain exactly what the terrain is like there yeah, it's uh, like riding the tram at Snowbird is one of the best runs in the world. And I, I can say that now after riding lots of places and seeing a lot of other places. But when I was growing up, I kind of assumed everybody got to ride a mountain like Snowbird. If, you, if you're a snowboarder or a skier, like that's normal. That was normal to me. So I was, I was like kind of ignorant to what, what else was out there. But yeah, it's a 3,000 vert mountain that you get a really long run. Your legs are burning, and you get to hit, you know, dozens of jumps every run. All different, ty- all different style of takeoffs, landings. Nothing, 
nothing really manicured or set up for you. It's like you got to find your own line and hit stuff and wall hits and different things like that that are kind of natural. So it really brings out, in my opinion, like the creativity of the individual who's riding the mountain. You have to read the mountain and, and like figure it out. And eat shit a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> what was your uh, bird look nickname? Because every, every kid in that era has a bird look nickname. Yeah, mine was Chappie. Chappy. That was Chappy. All yeah. right. Give an air horn for Chappy. Yeah, Chappy. Yeah. <laughs> That's what everybody called me. I think our little crew, we were like kind of third generation bird looks. So we kind of all adopted names of older bird looks, like kind of given to us by our friends. Oh, so, you had to take on? Yeah. Oh, this is like that retired. a full like a fraternity type of situation. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was like a hand-me-down nickname for a bunch of people. And one thing you didn't mention about that mountain is you never sit down. Yeah, you don't. It's the tram, you, right? Unless yeah. you're taking a break, you were always on the move, man. That mountain is no joke. Yep, it's a long fun, run. Fun fact, you, uh, the guy to the left of me has never taken a run in Snowbird. You never, never have. Yeah. So Snowbird, actually, send some been, tickets. I've and, actually been trying to keep that on the low, but let's get this guy to Snowbird. Through, through. Well, <laughs> it's, it's almost gone on so long at this point that it's like, why not keep it going? Like, well, fuck it. Let's I'm see how long I can live in Utah and not Snowbird ride it. Snowbird needs to send you a nice little package with a ticket as uh, yeah, well me, as a, uh, a hotel room maybe, a weekend yeah. stay, mm-hmm. and uh, we'll get Chris up there. Yeah, yeah the cool. Cliff Spa is real nice. You can lounge out in the spa. Go ride the bird. I'm in. I'm give, in. Give this 100%. guy the the treatment, and I'm sure. Yeah, there's a couple bird looks that are uh, freaking out at that. They're like <laughs> respect level just dropped <laughs> to the floor. I can't get, believe you've never. We'll get you up there. I've mountain biked. I've gone up the tram, okay. but um, that counts as something. Mm, I don't know if it does, but I do think that uh, I would love to check it out. It's just kind of was you know you get you get in your routine. I go to I go to Brighton. I go to Woodward, and it's just when it's harder to my get radar. passes there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so how Deadlong yeah, is such a cool can. nickname, and you you got Chappy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yep. Deadlong rides with, rhymes with Edlund. Uh, and Edlung, Deadlong. Ed, yeah, it was Edlung, Edlund. and then Deadlong, and that's, and it's well, that's probably one of the coolest nicknames yeah, there is. For there sure. is. Huh? Okay, well, you know, what? while we're on the subject of nicknames, uh, I kind of want to. I think this is a very fitting question. This is from our boy Cheeseburger. Major shout out to Cheese. Yeah, cheese. Absolute legend. Great nickname. And uh, yeah, also Cheeseburger, a little bit better than Chappie as well. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yo, Bombhole. It's your boy Cheeseburger. Hey, I heard you got my dog Bittner in the booth today. Uh, I got a question for you, Aaron. Who is Stony Hawk and uh, where did he live? Oh my anyway, God. love you guys. We'll see you. Stony Hawk. I think he filmed that with a Nokia flip phone. Yeah, that was like <laughs> yeah. the most low pixelated video I've ever seen I in my life. I felt like he was in some sort of metal box <laughs> with all sorts of, or from a toilet bowl. Cheeseburger or. echo from the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, who is Stony Hawk and where did he live? Wow. Yeah, that that's a throwback. So when I was 16, I had my first car, or no, I was probably 18 at this time. So like my third car was it was my sister's old Ford Taurus. I had just blown up my, I had like a Volkswagen Jetta, blew it up, didn't have a car for like a year. I got my sister's hand-me-down Ford Taurus. The trunk had been bashed in, like got she got rear-ended and just didn't, it wasn't worth fixing that car. So it had these like maroon bench seats in the front and I could slide this little bong, this little plastic bong, in between the seats and it just lived there and I worked at Snowbird at the time this is probably you know it's fine now but I think they did random drug tests back then and uh I would roll up the canyon dump some water in the bong and Stony Hawk and take a few rips before I'd go make sandwiches at the little (laughs) sandwich shop up there General Grits (laughs) I do have to say Stony Hawk is one of the best names for a bong yeah humanly boss that name just a sick name just happened huh yeah it was a bright yellow bong I don't know how it got named I don't know who named it or if it was me pretty sick pretty uh foggy times back then but (laughs) you just drive around with that in the car huh no worries in the world dude it slid right it was like it was probably like i don't know this big and it slid right between the bench seats and it would just hide hide out there that's so that was his home that was where story lived lived. (laughs) until i think i left it at someone's house and they broke it and then i was like man all right i thought maybe you sold it with a car unbeknownst to the (laughs) buyer That would have been amazing. I was talking to Cheeseburger uh, casually, and he's like, he's like, yeah, Bittner used to drive around with a little bong in his car named Stony Hawk. I'm like, that is <laughs> the best intel I could have possibly gotten for this whole podcast. <laughs> I forgot about that. 
Thanks, yeah, Cheese. That's what you're supposed to be doing when you're 18. Mm-hmm. That's like kind of the ideal. Just that's just how life works at that point in your life. Yeah, I made the best sandwiches too. I was all stony. <laughs> made the best sandwiches. At oh General yeah, <laughs> and th- so that's the the sandwich shop at the Bird. Mm-hmm. So you're full blown Bird Snowbird local. Yep. Got a job there. Got a job in General Grits when I was 16. And then the next season, I washed dishes at this restaurant that is now called 71, I think. Uh, I can't remember what it's All called. All these it used jobs to be called, just giving you passes? Yep, just to, just to get a season pass. And I think when I was 16, that was the last year they did, they were giving out unlimited passes to employees. So after that, you had to work there for like, Three, two or three seasons in order to get an unlimited tram pass. Oh, geez. They were, once you were, like, after that time period, it was like, you get a job at Snowbird and you can only ride chairs. You get a chairs-only pass. So if that happened, I probably wouldn't have been would working have stayed there. there huh? Would have oh. out another way to buy a pass or something. But, yeah, that was, that was huge, being able to work there. And also got to work a split shift, which was cool. We'd work, I'd work 8 a.m. to noon and then 4 p.m. to close. So I could... Be shred. up there all day and shred in the afternoon. And that was that was super, super good. Good for my my future career. Yeah, good for sharpening the old <laughs> teeth on the snowboard. Yep. Now, we're going to rip through another guest question because it kind of segues nicely <clears throat> to that. This guest question is from none other than Justin Benny. Yo, what's up, guys? Benny Blanco calling in. Bittner, my friend. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the first day you came out with us, finger on the trigger, and we hit Pyramid Gap. Well, you hit Pyramid Gap. I ate shit and then had a temper tantrum, as everyone could see. But, uh, yeah, talk about the trick you got, that experience for you, and then uh, at the end of the session where you had to go. That day just solidified you in the game, and it was an honor to be there. Anyway, fellas, I love you all, and uh, hype to hear this. Peace. Gia. Justin Benny. Thanks, Benny. Um, yeah, that day was crazy. Um, going back to working at Snowbird. I was working at Snowbird at the time. This was late spring, probably towards the end of March. Um and Dead Lung, Mark Edland, Mark Frank Montoya, and Justin Benny, along with E Stone, Cole Taylor, and Ian Rigby, were all going up to hit Pyramid Gap. And they called me up. They knew I had been kind of filming a bunch that year with some other homies and working on another project called Usable. But they, yeah, they called me up because there was an extra spot on the crew, basically. And guess they were like wondering if I'd actually hit it and see if we could get something so yeah that was like kind of a a big opportunity for me and I was like yep I'll come up it was kind of I think we rolled up kind of later in the day too it had been pretty warm springtime conditions so we had to let the snow soften up salt the in run do a bunch of work to smooth it out but it it was already built which was nice I think T. Rice and and Roman hit it before us that That was a dust off it's a little dust off yeah spring Yeah. Springtime though. Yeah. Total springtime. Kind of had to rebuild a little bit and then yeah, we hit it. I think MFM hit it first and he guinea pigged it, but he was just like I was like I, I don't even think I can go the same speed as him and make it. Like he can pop and do shit just like an alien. <laughs> He's just know. built different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, once that happened, we got the session started and I think I hit it hit it like a few times. I think first trick was a front 5. And land that, maybe I only hit it twice. I can't remember now. Like I can't remember that back that far. It's a long time I ago. did a front five, landed it, kind of rode out and t- took a tumble deep in the landing. And I was like, I'll just see if I can do a front seven too. And got a front seven on it. And then I was already late for work at the sandwich shop. And I had to basically bail and head back to work. I'm running late al- already. But once that happened... It was like, it was on. These guys were like, you should come out and try to get a couple more clips. I want to run it back to, how was that shift after going to Pyramid Gap, which is, for people that aren't familiar, gigantic gully gap where you land on a mining pile, and it's iconic and huge, and 
and you land a front seven with Mark Frank Montoya, and then you go back to your sandwich shop. Like, what was the vibe <laughs> at the sandwich shop that day? I was definitely feeling pretty good. Like, kids feeling himself. Making dude, I, I remember Cole wanted to like call a sandwich shop to be like, ah, let him come in later. Let him come in later. <laughs> like, we were just more stressed at trying to keep him up there longer because we were so stoked on him. Yeah, I was. I was stressing because I had already been probably not the most ideal employee at that time. Yeah. Stony like, Hawk in <laughs> rotation. So like, is it cool Hawk. if I come in a little later? Like, you guys can leave some prep work for me or whatever. Like, just, <laughs> you know, I got to have my back. I'm trying to film and, like, make something out of this. But, um, yeah, it was, it was like, kind of a just another normal day. But also, following that, hearing back from, like, Rigby hitting me up being like, you know, these guys were stoked. Um, so let's go and see if we can get some more clips, see if we you can have a few shots in the movie. And I was like, like, holy shit, I will definitely come out as much as possible. Like, let's go out every day. And Ian was really hungry too. These guys were all about it. It was the end of the season, so it was like season had tapered off. There weren't very mu- much or very many good jumps to hit or anything. It's like you got to just go chuck into springtime, like boilerplate snow go tumble in the slush or like slip the whole landing and hike it a bunch to even have a jump to hit. But we went out almost every day whenever we had time. Or if I was working, Ian would come up with the truck at night. I'd get off work at Snowbird. We'd go fill a truck up and then go hit a spot. And like, yeah, limitless energy back then too. I think just being so fired up and having like that young, young, hungry grind full of I, I remember some all nighters too like we'd get mm-hmm. the truck and start setting up late and be there till morning till the sun comes up yeah that was kind of the way too though yeah, like to hit a no spot at around. a school or something you kind of need to go in midnight like whatever. at midnight or one in the morning to be able to kind of be under the radar sun comes up and you're you. going home with a shot yeah if you watch the clips from that video it's it's insane because that video part is moment of truth which is unbelievably we got Good. a copy right here. Yeah, we got a copy. Mm. I could actually, we should, we can loop it because I have it on my computer. But um, basically, uh, you're, you're basically hitting these rails and the grass is green. It looks like it's in June. You hit that one hubba where you land on two ice cubes. <laughs> There's like no snow. Like it's basically like snowboarding on pavement in the middle of summer is fucking awesome. But And it basically yeah. was. <laughs> it was. It was summer. It was middle basically. of summer. <laughs> Wearing like a big jacket and trying to look all <laughs> yoed out for for the Tech Nine <laughs> crew, but yeah, a lot of that stuff we brought a lot more snow than was shown in the clips. But it either took a while to get the get the shot, or it took a while to even like get the balls up to even jump on some of these spots. So like, yeah, that ledge, that opening shot in Moment of Truth was like extremely terrifying. Probably late April or early June and like got luckily I had dead long and Corey Cronk there to like sling me into it. And they, it wasn't really a long in run, so it wasn't too crazy, but probably got slung into that a good 30, 40 times before I actually jumped on it. And the snow was melting and we were kind of running out of time and we already put in all the work driving up the Canyon to get the snow like we did today and then go down all the way out to, to like South Jordan, Brigham High School, and sitting there like, do I want to do this? Am I going to just fall off this and like get really hurt or is it going to work? So finally like jumped on it and slid kind of the inside, had to ride down the stairs and almost got hung up in there. And I was like, I just got to jump on and go for it. And I didn't, I don't think it took too many tries, but it took a lot of, a lot of psyching up to get that. That's a lot of bro slings right there, mm-hmm. too, 30 yeah, or 40. For sure. <laughs> right? Just, also, uh, one other one we got to talk about from that video part that, to me, it was iconic because the, it's to uh, Hood Hop. Great song, which I slapped uh, <laughs> at that point in time uh, heavily. But the, the last shot, you do a front board through a kink, which was not very common at that time, and then, again, land on three ice cubes. And, uh, <laughs> dude, let's talk about that clip. That was pro. I think that was the last clip I filmed for that part. That was early June, like probably pretty much early June, and we were kind of just looking for a few more clips or just seeing if we if there was anything else. And that was one thing that I kind of had a goal of doing that year. I'd already hit that rail earlier that season, like 
board slid the drop off side and I 50 50 the middle side. And I was like, I think I can maybe like fr- try to front board on that. It's like a long enough flat where I just felt like I could probably hit the kink and not get bucked off before I kind of recovered and was able to slide down the rest of it. But yeah, that was another thing. We had a lot more snow than was there when we did it or when I finally got the trick, but it took a lot of tries. I came off in the stairs a bunch and, um, ate shit down the stairs a couple of times too. And that was a hard one. That was a battle, but just went, went slow. So I didn't hit the kink as hard and was able to stay on it. But yeah, that was, that was huge. I was, I was really psyched to get that done and, and have that in my part for sure. Was that the Eisenhower one? That's Eisenhower yeah. kink. Yeah. Uh, yeah. so, Right over his shoulder. Right there. It's a, was that a checkout photo? That's a checkout photo, and shout out to Cheeseburger. He got that one printed for me. He got it blown up. And oh, he blew that up. Yeah, another air horn. Cole's um, got his wife beater looking all tough. Yeah, look at Cole. <laughs> <laughs> so what I was also uh, wanted to segue from that, in, in honor of that video part, which I do have to say had a gigantic impact on myself and my friends that are all my same age, and I think a lot of people in my generation, uh, we had it on repeat. You had first part, Benny had second, and it was like this shit just it just goes. So in honor of the video part where half of the clips are filmed um, after the season's over and in the summertime, what did we do today? Yeah, we we did a little throwback session. We did the full deal. Back to Snowbird, loaded up your truck with snow, took my drop and ramp, and we went and hit a rail. That was that was crazy. That was quite the adventure, man. Brought back thanks some for, good memories. Seven. Thanks for the idea, Stone, and thanks for the execution, both of you guys. That was I didn't know Cole was coming. Yeah, that yeah. was we got like, the, so Cole was, was the so filmer sick. for Tech Nine that filmed all this stuff, and an owner as well as E Stone for those that are unfamiliar, mm-hmm. and uh, Bittner Road for Tech Nine. So we get, basically got the entire gang back together. Cole was there filming. E Stone's shooting photos. Bittner's wearing a Tech Nine uh, <laughs> jersey, baseball yep. jersey or some shit yeah, with a jersey. sky high resi tip and some fat camos. And he put up a front board in June, uh, which is the month it is now. And uh, it was about ninety degrees. There was again three mm-hmm. ice cubes in the landing, and it was just <laughs> it was perfect. It was a perfect little. Uh, what? How many years later now? I mean, the last time I did that was probably 15 years ago. Like I did it. I did one import session with, with Mac Dog to a spot out in, in like, Magna, and didn't end up getting the trick. I tried Let's to frontboard a triple. Kick when did we film Moment of Truth? You know, that was like 2003, Three. 2004 season, I think. Wow. Or 04, 05. I'm pretty sure it's 0, 03, 04. Yeah, that's 17 years ago. That's pretty rad. Guys still yeah, got I was it. 20. I was yeah, 20 years it. old then, and I'm 37 now. You so, yeah. still got it. Nothing like a 37-year-old man that's just, like, you're, like he was late today because uh, he had an HVAC guy at his house. Like, <laughs> yep. that's what starts, <laughs> when you're 20, you don't have an HVAC guy <laughs> coming over. You know, he's, like, fixing All you your think AC about unit. Is shot. You're just like, no, I'm, yeah, I'm 20 years old. I'm going to go front board this kink and, like, ragdoll down the concrete. <laughs> I don't give a shit about anything. He's like, oh, sorry, I'm late. The snow's mom. I got a, I got an HVAC guy in my house. Like that, we're getting yeah. old, man. That's I was pulling out, and he pulled up. Literally, like, oh man, that's like the worst timing. I thought I was making an appointment for tomorrow, and he's like, I was just in the neighborhood. I thought I'd stop by, and I was like, God, it's hard to explain that too. Like, I'm gonna go. We just filled a truck up with snow, and we're gonna go hit <laughs> the a rail. Snow's in this melting. Park. I gotta go. <laughs> like, is it cool if I just leave you here? And he was like, Yeah, that's fine. I didn't tell him that. I was like. I kind of have a meeting I got to get to right now. So, <laughs> oh, you just left the dude there? Yeah, sick. <laughs> I let him in, and like I had to take him down to my basement to look at the furnace because he needed to see what the furnace was in order to You're understand. Lucky you didn't just get your house jacked right there. Well, I, I took him inside, and then I left him outside to deal with like, oh, the, gotcha. the outdoor outso- part. outdoor AC. <laughs> we thought unit, you maybe but... got in a car accident today. Yeah. On the way there. We, we were watching the, the snow melt. No, I was literally <laughs> pulling out. I was pulling out, and he pulled up in front of my house, and I was like, "This is just." The best timing right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's a funny thing thinking back on the session today because you went up, you 50 it, like front boarded it, 50 back on 80, all that things. But like, you know, the amount of time that has been spent standing on, on top of a drop in ramp, like staring down a handrail where you're like, okay, here we fucking go. Right. Like yep. hours and hours and hours of tries and tries. Thousands yeah. and thousands of tries. Lots of lots of tries. Lots of mess ups. Mm-hmm. Lots of uh, yeah. Kinda, it's two thousands kinda, and thousands. Did yeah, you bring sure. back? Did you bring back any? Uh, did you you like clicked into like memory lane zone or? A little bit, yeah. I was thinking about the ramp too. Like I've used that ramp. We used to use that ramp everywhere. We'd take it to Finland. Like we'd 
one of us would load load that ramp into a board bag and take it to Finland. It was like a hundred pounds, almost a hundred pounds to take this thing in a board bag, pay extra like over oversized baggage fees and stuff. And then you'd spend a good couple hours assembling it and you'd have to have like a big enough van or a truck to roll around with that thing in. But yeah, we use that ramp everywhere. We had one in Minnesota as well that just lived in a storage unit with some other stuff as well. But yeah, that ramp, luckily that's consistent. It wasn't using well a, a wooden ramp, something janky. It kind of felt like old times for sure, but pretty nerve wracking to step to a rail with no snow anywhere. <laughs> hope I don't just catch my edge and like die. Oh, so, yeah. Right on the drop-in. Yeah, that too. 37 years old, sitting there in a Tech 9 jersey, 90 degrees. Like, what are we doing mm-hmm. with our lives? There's, like, people walking by, like, what the fuck are you guys doing? Like, Those yeah. ladies were stoked, they too. Were, yeah, they were yeah, stoked. A couple they were people so posted up. The only thing that would have made it more authentic is if Dead Lung and Casey Nelson pulled you into the rail, homie. That time. would have been amazing. We should have almost done we that. We should have arranged that recruited. for old time's sake. But uh, I don't think Dead Lung will pull you in 37 times at this stage in his no. career. Nope, and the the ramp is definitely a little more efficient. <laughs> yeah. Gets your speed dialed right. You don't have to be you like, killed it out there today, though. That, that was, was a banger. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Just didn't want to eat shit too bad. That could wreck my, my summer plans. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's just jump back into this chronological arc of your career here because it, it's, it's, it was fucking insane. So you, you're relatively unknown, uh, snowboarder from snowbird filming in small local videos but really nobody knows who aaron bittner is film moment of the truth all of a sudden asshole kids on the east coast like myself are like aaron bittner's one of my favorite stores holy shit right and then right after you know you're on you're on tech nine and all these things happen so fast and then you know what what was that process like and what happened after getting on tech nine was already something that i was like completely blown away by like that was a a goal of mine that was like unattainable, you know, like growing up watching these movies. It was like, for me, it was Tech Nine and Mac Dog were my favorite movies to watch. They got me the most psyched to go snowboarding and the, the soundtracks, especially in the Tech Nine movies was always like just the best. I'd find all that music, listen to it and you could, you know, remember whose part it was and just like get super stoked. And I was always like, if I ever got to film with them, that would be, insane like just being able to do that was huge like a huge accomplishment for me like something I never thought I'd get to do so that was already something crazy and after that season since we had been kind of grinding so hard and filming until super late in the season like I think I hit that Eisenhower kink within like a few days or a week before the Red Bull heavy metal contest happened downtown so I had been basically like hitting hitting rails and big handrails and stuff all the way up until the lead up to that contest. And I was also emailing the the, the chick that was in charge of, of like kind of letting people into the to the contest. I emailed a few different people and ended up with this lady named April, who is now shout out Mikey Blanc, Mikey LeBlanc. Um yeah, they're they're together, but nice. she was she was super cool. She emailed me back, told me like, you know, probably not going to happen, but let's keep trying and kept trying, kept checking in with her. And she told me like, just come down on the day of and we'll see if anybody doesn't show up. We'll see what happens. So I like rolled down to the Delta Center with my board in my car, walked up and just tried to find her. Didn't know what she looked like or anything. I'd just been emailing with her and um, found her said like I'm here ready to go in case you guys need another guy in the contest and and they she told me like right then like you know what just go get your stuff and be ready to go you, you're in the qualifiers and I was like yes I can't believe that that's so sick I get to do a rail contest after I've been you know I was like I feel pretty good on my snowboard right now I'm, it's not like I'm I feel obligated to do it I was like psyched like you just front board to Eisenhower can't confidence is high <laughs> yeah I was like i I know I can do okay in this at least. Like, I'm not going to be the worst, hopefully. <laughs> but, yeah, did that contest. Ended up winning. Ended up winning the qualifiers. And I was just, like, running up and down the stairs trying to get as many tricks as I could. And MFM was one of the judges. And he came up to me after I'd done, like, a bunch of tricks. And he tapped me. And he's like, dude, stop snowboarding. Like, 
you're good. You're in the finals. <laughs> and I was like, okay, like, okay, no, I don't want to stop till it's over though. Like, this is fun. <laughs> but he was just like, yeah, chill out, dude. You're in the finals now. Like, you're good. And ended up winning the qualifiers. So that was the first money I ever made off snowboarding was that. like How many baskies? Got, got paid a thousand bucks okay. for winning the qualifiers. That was... Okay, for the layman's that are unfamiliar too, I just want to run back and say that Red Bull Heavy Metal contest, what it was was a street contest at the Delta Center where the Utah Jazz play. So they had actual handrails and they brought in imported snow and you were sliding actual real handrails with concrete stairs and uh, basically just to kind of paint that picture. So yeah, keep going with the winning the, the money in there. So. Yep, so won the qualifier, made a thousand bucks, which was amazing. That was like more money than I've ever seen in one check i was like holy shit got a thousand bucks from snowboarding that's amazing got into the finals i was a little bit burnt out by that time like and the big dogs were in the finals so it was just an honor to be strapping in next to like jeremy jones and mfm and all these other big dogs that were in the finals and that was epic but there was like some big tricks going down big gap trails and stuff that i was like yeah i can't i'm not gonna do a back 270 right now like i was already feeling pretty pretty cooked and kind of kind of redlined myself in the in the qualifiers but just being able to be in the finals was epic still got a few more tricks started to get dark and it became like this big event at night where it's huge crowd and it was just like yeah really cool thing to be a part of and just get to see that side of snowboarding later that summer mac dog called me like brad kramer and mike mcintyre called my house they got my my number from milo and they like called my house and my dad came to my room and told me like Brad Kramer and Mike McIntyre on the phone for you and I was like yeah right like who's <laughs> who's messing with me like somebody I thought for sure one of my buddies is like go get Aaron tell him it's like Mac dog on the phone like that'd be a <laughs> funny prank but yeah it really was them got on the phone with them and they're like hey is it cool like we saw you riding at that contest it was hard to fi- like track you down and figure out who you were but um is it cool if we use some of that footage in our extras part in chulk smack and i was like duh of course like for sure you use that if you want i'd be stoked and they so they put my footage in like from the contest in their like little recap of the contest and the extras of that film and they were just kind of like pretty nonchalant about being like yeah would you be interested in maybe coming on a trip next year and see how you fit in and see how you do and i was like i mean yeah i'd love to like i'm not making a dime off snowboarding. I don't know if I can make that work, but I'd love to try to make that happen. And, you know, came back to these guys to stone and Cole, and was like, might have an opportunity to, you know, film with Mac dog. And, and they're like, well, we'll help, we'll help make that happen. Like awesome support from them. And that was kind of like, that was before moment of truth had come out. And we were kind of all leading up to that and trying to see what the next season had in store for us anyways. And, that was just a huge opportunity that I couldn't pass up as well, but still hadn't even met those guys or anything. Just talked with them on the phone and it was kind of like, maybe I'm going to get to go on a trip with Mac dog. That'd be crazy. But kind of went from like that season into like straight into Mac dog. And all of a sudden it was just go time. What was the first, what was the first movie uh, project? You were it follow of? me around. No, it was from, from blank with love or from, ah. from MDP with love. Mm-hmm. No, I don't know how they actually ended up. It was like from blank with love. It was kind mm-hmm. of a half, it was like a two disc or travel two. and part. Based. Yeah, it was like a travel based film that they kind of edited with all the writers from different locations of different places we shot. And then there's also a, another one that was just all video parts. So everybody had their parts cut up. Dude. One thing I got to highlight that I've been wanting to run back to is you talk about how you sh- <clears throat> basically like, I need to get in this contest Red Bull, uh, heavy metal, and you didn't get in. Like, nobody was like, you're in. Nobody said you're going to be in this contest, which Mm -hmm. normally that's a roadblock for an average person. An average person says, oh, shit, well, I didn't get into the contest. I'm not going to go, right? I'm not going to go. But that that tenacity and that, I guess, unwillingness to take no for an answer, and then we had had Shane Charlebois on here, and, and the advice he was giving is like, Sometimes you just got the best. The, the trick is just showing up. I think that's what he said. Right? Yeah, yeah. The trick is just showing up, and and you know, look at the way your career blossomed because you just essentially were like, I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm going to be in this contest. I'm going to show up, and I'm going to make it happen. And and that is like something to be noted. You know what yeah. they call that? 
what, what do they call that? A Cinderella story. It is a goddamn <laughs> Cinderella story. You're right, buds. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Yeah, I was <laughs> relentless and oh, like super polite about it, but I was pretty, I was probably pretty annoying, like hitting, hitting April up a ton, just being like, just wanted to check in, like seeing Squeaky if there's a, an opportunity <laughs> here. Like, let's see, I'm, I'm ready in, in case you need me. Like, I'm ready to go. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd really appreciate it and love it if I could get into this thing, but you know, I understand if not, but yeah, I'll show up and I'll be there and I'll be ready to go in case you don't have someone that no shows or someone's hurt or whatever. Like I'll be ready. So she didn't know you were the import King. Yeah. <laughs> Just ready, ready <laughs> for know this contest. All he needs is like a, uh, basically a snow cone on the way. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's ready to he's go. Ready to rock. <laughs> Speaking uh, of contests, what was the contest where you came back with a stack of gold bars and I bought one off you? Yeah, that and was, it, and it went up. It, I ended up bought it from you for I don't remember how much, but it went yeah. up to like nine hundred bucks. Yeah, slanging bars. Yeah, he was slanging gold bars when he got back from some trip overseas. I think. Yeah, they're probably worth like I don't remember. We I won like thirteen grand in gold. Yeah. Where at? That's some in, biscuits. It was called the Red Bull Rail Storm. And yes. okay. They're Red Bull gold bars. Oh, wow. Yeah, little one-ounce gold bars. One, one like, we, I was on Team USA. They, they did this, like, team-based thing called Red Bull Rail Storm. It took place in Trafalgar Square in London. They set up a, a scaffolding setup with, like, three or four different rails going down some stairs. And the drop in was like all scaffolding and shit. And it was team based. So there was like Team USA, Team Finland, Team Sweden, Team Denmark, kind of a bunch of different countries were represented. Canada, I think. Um, so we all flew in. We were all staying in the same hotel. Red Bull put us up. Super nice. But I think we were there for like two days, two nights or something. So we flew in the night before, got there in the morning when they were setting up, watched them. Watched them, like, setting it up, walked around London, tried to stay awake and, like, kind of adjust. Slept that night, and the next the next night was the contest. And then we flew home the next day. So we were basically landed in the morning, watched who's the your, setup. Who's your team, and how'd you do? Eddie Wall was team captain. and Not bad. Yeah, shout-out Eddie Wall. Big shout-out. Put Such together a, a solid team. So it was Eddie Wall, Mike Casanova, and myself. Oh, damn. Wow. Shout out Mike Casanova, too. Yeah, um, straight up. And you guys just all split the gold? He was rail rail king of rail yeah, jam He was like dominator. the rail jam king. Yeah. He, both of those dudes were so damn good at hitting rails, and especially rail jam tricks. They had, like, some some heaters that nobody could match, so they were killing it. Like Eddie, Back then, it was, like, Eddie Wall or, like, MFM winning all the contests, all the rail contests. Eddie Marco, would do the, the hammer sleeves. He'd blow his sleeves up above his elbows. You know he means yeah. business. No, it's time. The hammer yep. sleeves. Yeah, Eddie was so sick. But yeah, we, we ended up winning that. But we we made it to finals with three teams. So it was like Team USA, Team Sweden, and Team Finland that were in the finals. And before finals, it was like we were gonna be it was gonna be like twenty pieces of gold for first, ten pieces of gold for second, and like five or five for third or something. So still like five ounces of gold for third place is good. But we all went back, and we were like, this is crazy that we're even here, and this thing's happening, and we're all winning gold. Let's, like, let's all agree right now to, like, just split it up evenly between all of us. three teams. Yeah, so nine of us split a bunch of gold, and we all got the first place team ended up, because it didn't even out properly, we got a couple pieces more than the other two teams. But, yeah, I think got, like, 13 ounces of gold and flew back with that just in my backpack. <laughs> They were cool too, all pressed with Red Bull. What kind mm-hmm. of? I don't know, know what the value. Is, how much fiscal of oh, a gold bar? Gold back that then. Was that was probably two thousand five or two thousand six, maybe oh seven. But I think gold was like maybe around seven hundred or nine hundred bucks an ounce, maybe a thousand an ounce back then. I think it went up to like. Yeah, I think it went up fifteen hundred. Yeah, fifteen hundred a bar or something. So, yeah, I wish I still had all that gold. Back then, I needed oh, the money. Well, dude, uh, so one thing we got to talk about that we have breezed past, and we don't give a shit about chronological order here on the bomb hole. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to give you a keyword. I'm going to let you take it from here. Max yeah. Air Snow Flyers. Mm, that's a good, that's a, that's predates all my snowboarding career yeah, for yes, sure. Yes, it does. So, it, Back when I was 18 in the Stony Hawk days. Um, Stony Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
And cheeseburger, it was a big part of this. Cheeseburger's the one who got me this job. He's like but, the Barnum Bailey of this fucking whole operation. Yeah. <laughs> cheeseburger pitched me as a potential snowboarder for this operation that they had. Cheeseburger was the the trampoline acrobat. Slash uh sometimes I think he was the MC as well. He would be on the mic. And also trampoline acrobat. We were basically carnies. We were going to different fairgrounds and different festivals and stuff. And we'd either build a, a giant ramp out of scaffolding, like a ski jump, like literally drop in, go straight down, and it's a ski jump. And my job was to go do a backflip on cue throughout this kind of like set choreographed What show. were you landing on? Sorry. The- it was a, uh, so there was like a death gap. Yep. Over either concrete or asphalt or grass. If we were lucky, grass was a little bit better. And you have to make this gap, first of all. And then there was a like a slanted airbag. We'd have a couple fans that we'd have to have plugged in, and it would inflate this airbag. And I'd just go and do a backflip and land on this airbag. It had, like, AstroTurf that they laid over the airbag, and they'd spray, we'd spray, like, automotive silicone on it and spray it down with the hose. We also had a hose at the top of the ramp and we'd have somebody rappel down the ramp. One of the guys would like rappel down the ramp with a, a, like a backpack sprayer and spray soapy water all over the plastic, like meanie stuff. I think it was called that you'd ride down basically like the, the bristles kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. You'd ride down this ramp, you'd do a backflip. I landed probably 20% of them <laughs> and throughout all the different shows we did. Most of the time I would just eat shit i'd either over rotate or under rotate or i'd land and stick and like flip over the bars and land on the dirt or on the asphalt we you have to like, build the ramp too yeah th- there was one ramp that we built that it all rolled in a in like a trailer and we had to build it out of scaffolding and level it and how the, how we got away with that like was crazy but it, it all worked and then there was another ramp called the transformer that was like this big semi-trailer ramp that would would lift up with hydraulics so it was like this crazy, crazy big ramp. It must have cost a ton of money to get that thing too. But yeah, Max Air, Craig so, Peterson was the a, guy running it. A couple, um, a couple things we got to touch on. Uh, apparently, Cheeseburger was jumping on the trampoline with uh, skis. No, he was. Uh, he, he was skiing. Did, no, snowboard. Snowboards. Oh, I guess he at one point he did to use skis. He might have used skis but too. But jumping actually. on a trampoline with a snowboard, and he also said a bike, but mainly a, a snowboard. Um, so if you can picture Cheeseburger jumping on a trampoline with a snowboard while Bittner goes off of a bristle ramp over a death gap and flips <laughs> and then pancakes into an airbag, uh, I, I personally am pushing pretty hard for a, a Max Air Snow Flyer reunion tour. Yes. Is there a way we can dig that up? And We uh, need to find that footage. Yeah. What kind of money were you guys making? Yeah, what kind of, of biscuits kind of on that? I mean, so we'd go out for like, it kind of depended on on the show or on the tour, basically. Um, there were certain guys that were on the road full time, kind of like they'd have shows that were like in Indiana, South Dakota, um, East Coast, Virginia or something. And I think I did like, I did probably four or five shows with them total. I think I did Rock Springs, Wyoming, did something in South Dakota. That's actually another story. My first, uh, my first and only night spent in jail. Oh, I uh, that. Three doors, three doors down concert, I believe. Yeah, three doors down or something like <laughs> you that. You can hit us with the cliff notes of that if you need to. Yeah, we got to we got to South Dakota, Sioux Falls. Ended up rolling into town, want needing to set up our stuff. You guys are carnies. You got to set up carnies. your carnies. Carnies. Roll into the fair. Yep. Get our little spot, and they're not ready for us to set up. They don't have everything there for us, so they're like, "Here's some drink tickets and some, and you can go see this concert, which was like some sort of." Um, mediocre concert at best. Three doors down. Three doors down. Three doors down, I think. And uh, yeah, it sucked. But we had free drink tickets. I got, I had one tall boy. I was 18 at the time. But they gave us like wristbands and drink tickets. So they're like, just go ahead and go in. Went and got, went out by myself to go get another beer. And this cop grabbed me. And then I had all the cops around me, like five or six cops. And after getting kind of, rolled pretty hard by him for a bit. I was like, what are you guys going to do? Like, what what happens now? Like, do you give me a ticket or what? And they're just like, got super pissed, put me in cuffs, st- pulled my shit out of my pockets, found this fake ID that I had that was like another person and took me to jail, charged me with uh, 
yeah, like a fraud charge basically saying I was impersonating, like false impersonation, impersonating another person. They're like, you must have used this to get your wristband, blah, blah, blah. So spent the night in jail. My bond was $125 and I had $117 in my wallet and they wouldn't let me out. I could have paid my bond if I had $125 in my wallet. I needed eight bucks. Yeah. Wow. Eight bucks. I had to wait for cheeseburger to figure out where I was, come to jail and come get me. Then we left town and I didn't go back to South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> so you've never been back. No. Open warrant. That's a good move. Being a stupid kid. Yeah, that's what you're supposed to do when you're 18, though. That's just kind of like. And yeah, Max Air. I think we made all right money, though, back to Cheddar Biscuits. I think we'd make like maybe a thowie or two per show, depending on how long the show was and how many shows per day. But we'd do like every show had its, had the same layout. Like you'd, they'd do the announcements and then the che- like Cheeseburger and the other trampolinist would be on the sides of the landing. And then we'd have like four people up top, like a couple skiers, a couple snowboarders. And then we'd all go down like kind of one after another and then climb back to the top of the ramp and we'd have to hit the jump like five times per show. Maybe so, more. So what? it's summer. You're boarding on bristles. What are you rocking for a kit here? Oh, yeah. We basically, I looked like a gymnast or something. Like I had like some sort of weird jersey material, like tight shirt. Did it have like, like did it say Mad, Mad X, whatever? Max Air. Max I don't, Air. don't think it said Max Air. I think it was just kind of like a blank kind of like, like almost like a gymnast type Who shirt. Who was Max, your boss? No, Max, Max Air. Max Air. <laughs> My boss is Craig Peterson, also a snowbird gotcha. legend. <laughs> But yeah, dude. Oh my gosh, that was that was a that wish. Was a wild wish I could see you on that tour. Reunion tour sounds great, dude. Yeah, I had like warm up pants on, like <laughs> warm up like, pants, like, too. <laughs> warm up pants and like a tight like, shirt. Wind and, pants? Is that what we're talking? And a helmet. I think I had to wear a helmet. Oh, go well, sure you had a domer on them. back yeah, in that day. Domer, just sure. do a wildcat off the jump and hope I either. How old were you at this time? Eighteen. Eighteen. Yeah. God, we need to bring back the Max Air. We need footage. I'll find some footage. If for we you. can find it, we'll insert it. If not, we won't. I'll, I'll snow, find some footage. You got to see that. Flyers, man. Yeah. The snow you flyers. Shit on a, on a summer ramp. Should we throw a quick Patreon Let's question? Let's do it. Let's do it. A little page question for all of our members. So uh, this is from William Mayo. You always had amazing style and a positive, humble attitude. Thanks for introducing my generation to the vision you had for snowboarding. Can you put into words what it meant to you in those early years? I could say the same thing to so many of the guys I looked up to. Like just being able to share share the passion and and kind of show respect to the guys that came before me, like style wise and and trying to do things as properly as I felt like all the guys before me were trying to like really strive for in their video parts and stuff was like something I put a real high value on, not just doing tricks to do them, but like figuring out what works with my style and what works with my kind of personality and what, what I feel like is going to look good or feel good. Not just like I got to learn this trick because everybody's doing it or something. So yeah, trying to share that kind of passion and creativity with snowboarding, not just competitive kind of jock style is more like, what do I relate to and how can I relate to other people or hopefully people relate can relate to that kind of outlook more than just trying to be like the quote unquote best or something. So it was always all about just kind of like doing things somewhat my way, but also really paying respects to like everybody that came before me and, and like really paved the way for all of us. So when you got lucky with mentors, it seems like, you know, you had Marco at this first big jump. And then when you went on with Mac dog, you had Jeremy Yep, I was, a lot of uh, people took you under their wing. It seems like, and yeah, a lot absolutely. of a lot that happens to a lot of snowboarders too. It seems like, well, mm-hmm. they they take yeah they take the right people under yeah. their wing that they see. And I've seen you do for. that with kids, and I know people did that for you as yep. well. Yeah, definitely. That's that's always really that was a huge part of it for sure. Like having people kind of take me under their wing, kind of give me some advice here and there, or, or being open to for me to ask questions at least. Like Jeremy was huge, and. He came over to my house before I, like, filmed with with Dogger. I think kind of looking in, looking towards that season as I was like trying to hustle and figure out how to, like, how am I going to actually be able to afford to travel and and film like a Mac Dog video part? I know that's a lot more expensive than just grabbing some snow and hitting a rail in Salt Lake, but we were able to make that work and just kind of hearing what what their two cents was and hearing from you guys kind of what what you had seen 
and talking with Marco, stuff like that. Like that's huge to have some mentors and have somebody you can bounce some questions off of and get an understanding for what the the landscape is like at this certain time. So yeah, I think I remember you needed a minimum of 10 grand travel budget or something to even like say yes yep. to get on the Mac dog crew. Yeah, it was kind of, or else you wouldn't be able to hang that was the, with them. They were the marquee biggest video. Out yeah. There. Yeah. Just 10 grand was like too small, just like, enough to maybe make it. Like I, I filmed, I filmed that. I remember like that season after like filming from blank with love. I was, uh, I was like, five grand in debt after that season. Oh, really? Yeah. And I went and lived in Colorado for that summer with Deadlong, and we painted a house and was able to kind of recoup some recoup. of that money and get ready for the next season and also just kind of do something completely different than just grinding hard, snowboarding, like s- switch it up, go work hard, and then get back for the next season all fired up. Yeah, a couple things talking about what we were just talking about I want to run run back to is talking about, you know, for example, you had Marco and Jeremy Jones mentor you in some senses, and you look at, like, if, if I'm looking at somebody and I'm like, what's their potential? The determining factor for me, if I'm looking at a young snowboarder coming up, of what their potential is, is how much drive do they have? Because talent only gets you so far. Style only gets you so far. Drive, to me, is the determining factor. So when you look at yourself at, at a young age, when you're talking about showing up, hitting rails in June, showing up to, to Red Bull, uh, heavy metal without a spot. Those are those are all factors of just like tremendous drive. And then you mix in drive with being humble, as you can say, showing respect to your elders and things like that. As well as, um, lastly, there's drive, being humble, and then having good style. That's that was the other thing I was gonna say. And and that combination is is what drawn has drawn people to you. You know, so I think that those are are all good things. And I've seen a constant of. Uh, working hard in your in your kind of career path and in your life whether you're working on your house here in salt lake whether uh do you attribute work ethic to some of your success you have yeah you have to like gotta be you can't be afraid to work hard and and you can't be selfish about it you know like sometimes you're working hard for other people like you're working hard to help someone else get a get a shot or working hard to help someone else accomplish something but showing up and being there and being a part of the crew means like, yeah, you have people that are going to show up for you too. And, and that's always something that I felt like was super necessary in snowboarding and, and to be successful as a snowboarder, like you got to have a support system and a group and, and you don't really want anyone on your crew. That's not going to show up and be like a hundred percent there supportive, not just like, I'm only here to, today to get my clip and then I got to go do some other stuff. Like if you're a pro snowboarder, then you got to take that seriously and show up to work every day. Like not just all of a sudden think like I'm hot shit and I'm going to go show up just to get my clips or I'm going to show up on a trip for just two days and then I got to do this other stuff or something like that was the coolest thing about being on the Mac dog crew. That was like how everybody functioned. It's like you're either a part of this crew or you're not and you got to show up or else we're going to find someone else that will. And, you know, it wasn't necessarily put to me like that, but that's just kind of how, you, if, you, if you're smart enough to see that, like that's kind of what, the way it has to work, or else it's not going to, you know, it's not going to work. Same with finger on the trigger too. Like if you just show up, do your do your stuff, then you'll be rewarded for it. And, um, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. Just work hard. Don't be afraid to work hard, and don't expect to get, something for it all the time as long as you're known as a hard worker you'll it'll it'll progress your career path yeah Yeah, i've been on some trips where you see that one kid who won't help anybody and Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden it's his turn to go and he's freaking out because no one's helping him and it's like (laughs) yeah you're not seeing what's going on like you didn't (laughs) help anyone all week and now you expect help like these guys are out man yeah 100 and that's don't want to have that dynamic on a crew (laughs) too and they're not people people are at each other's throats because like they're pissed that somebody's not helping it's different if it's like a photographer who's like i need to go get a new battery or charge my charge my camera or yeah uh, find an angle or something but the the riders you're there for one reason like you're here to set up a spot if you don't want to hit it then you should have a shovel in your hand and you should be helping whoever else hit it and that'll get get you all done quicker if you're just going to sit there and mope because it's not your spot like i don't i don't have a trick for this rail or something so you're just going to sit in the car you're not helping anyone and you're kind of you're kind of getting some animosity going and stewing. 
So you're not getting a phone call for the next trip. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly. also what's happened. <laughs> yeah, but that's the worst when people when everybody agrees like we don't want to bring that guy again. You don't want to be that guy, <laughs> yeah. for sure. And it happens. Yep. So to kind of paint a picture of where you're at with your career at this point, you know, Snowbird, Moment of Truth, Mac Dog. So within two years, you're filming biggest production company, and obviously with that comes money, fame accolades fans things that go to your head right and i've known you as somebody who's always been humble throughout this whole process and that's a fascinating thing to me because like it's so easy to become a cocky prick i mean i've been a cocky prick before (laughs) i've got like so i'm like how did you do it and you didn't become a completely (laughs) cocky prick like that's what i want to know but uh, honestly yeah how did you stay humble through that that quick because for well just to continue real quick like first fame first fame is a real thing when somebody first gets a little bit of shine you see it you're like oh shit this guy's feeling himself this girl's feeling herself he hasn't been kicked in the nutsack yet like he's and and you never really had that phase you know i got kind of lucky i guess because my career started later like i didn't really my career kind of started fast looking back on it it started really fast but it didn't start till i was 20 after I had kind of, kind of already written off that possibility in my life, like mentally, personally, I was like, I mean, yeah, probably don't have like what Justin Benny has or something like who had been a pro snowboarder since he was like 16. And that kind of seemed like that's the path to getting somewhere back then, at least, you know, like not being jealous or comparing myself, but I was just like, yeah, I might, I might not be able to, to like make it in snowboarding, but I'm still going to make sure I just have fun and enjoy myself and and figure out to me it was like one of the most important things in my life so I figured out a way like different ways to make it happen and to be able to go film with my friends and stuff like that so I kind of just like got to a point where I just realized what was important and had to put myself in check and just say I want to film and have fun and and see what happens but not really not setting too high of expectations and and you know trying to cherish and value every moment as corny as that sounds it's like you know snowboarding is a young man's game and while I was feeling really good I wanted to you know while my body felt good and everything I wanted to see what I could do and push myself not necessarily to get famous or to to like make a ton of money or something but it was like a personal challenge and just you know trying to figure out different spots to hit and places to go and being fascinated with filming and photography and stuff like that. Like that whole side of it was also really fun. Like the creative side, not just like wanting to learn a trick to know how to do a cool trick or something. It was like, how can we, what kind of trick would be cool at this spot and shoot it the right way. And that was always just really fun. The whole composition and the whole process. So, um, yeah, coming into the game a little bit later, I think, and having to work really hard before then. Give you um, some appreciation. It wasn't handed to you. Something yeah. like that. Maybe. Like I definitely worked worked a lot. I broke my tailbone and my wrist right after I turned 18. Broke my wrist. And then I was doing, it was a different Red Bull contest. It was called the Red Bull Huck Fest. Um, did a switchback seven. Landed and broke my wrist. And I was working at Snowbird at the time as a dishwasher. And ended up... Staying overnight, I had a cast on up to here, so my arm was just, like, stuck like this. Stayed overnight because it snowed. It, had, it was, like, an inner lodge night. Canyon closes, and nobody's allowed up or down. And we got a, got to go out first tram on, like, a three-foot day. Jumped off this cliff. Looked like it was going to be perfect. Landed on my ass and broke my tailbone. <laughs> broke my tailbone right off of my pelvis. And Well, you were in a cast well, like I was this. in a cast. <laughs> and had to get myself, like, figure out. After laying in the snow for a while, freezing my ass, I was able to get myself down, like kind of just side slip my way down and get to the clinic and was hobbling in there with my ri- <laughs> like my <laughs> cast on. And they're like, is something wrong with your arm? And I'd just been in there like three weeks before. And I was like, no, I fell on rocks. Like my something's wrong. Like, bad. <laughs> Tailbone and hurts too. It's huh? an 18-year-old Aaron Bittner just going hard. Right <laughs> going there. That's hard. all that is. <laughs> but yeah, back to, back to working and stuff. Like I... I didn't have insurance. So I was kicked off my parents' insurance. So I was all of a sudden like thousands of dollars in debt, like with all these medical expenses. And I was like, oh my God, like life is all of a sudden smacking me in the face really hard. I'm injured. I have to pay all this shit back. Basically couldn't like, that was like thousands of dollars. I was like, I don't even have like 20 bucks in the bank. So kind of had to 
suffered through that whole thing too, like wrecking my credit, learning about being an adult a bit and like learning that, you know, it's, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be an easy life. So, um, yeah, you should definitely count your blessings and be stoked. Like don't, don't let it get to your head. I mean, snowboarding was just a, a blessing. So God damn it. I love that. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you, I think uh, it might be time for a little segment of the show. Oh yeah. What we got here. It's, uh, what we call the liquid death this is the new thing. wheel of death. And we got a new uh, we got a new intro song. Here we go. Welcome to the liquid death. Death, death, death. Spinning wheel of death. <laughs> yeah. That intro was uh from Mikey LeBlanc. He recorded that. <laughs> that was Mikey. <laughs> yeah. Sound familiar. I was wondering who that was. Yeah, uh, Buds and I, Whew. we love, uh, I've, I've already put down two of these bad boys on the set. I'm on like three. Yeah, it's hot in mm-hmm. here. We're uh, we're crushing cans. Yeah, I like to crush cans, we, and yeah. I don't know, I don't want to drink beer. Nope, these exactly. Our thirst quenching. They're quenching, and if you see them at 7-Eleven, you can get them there. Uh, you can get them at Whole Foods, I believe, as well. Yeah, I saw them today, two for three bucks at 7. There it is. You can Whew. also, uh, if, you, if you don't want to go to the store, you can go to liquiddeath.com slash bombhole, put in that code. You'll get yourself a couple free koozies. So uh, if you're interested in crushing can, chugging some liquid death, head on over to murdering your thirst. And also not contributing to the plastic waste. Mm -hmm. uh, Death to plastic. It's uh, good for the environment. So head on over to liquiddeath.com slash bombhole. Order yourself up some nice cans. And uh, instead of getting shit-faced, you can get hydrated. And crush Mm -hmm. cans. So Crush let's get those cans. So for the people that are unfamiliar, we have the liquid death spinning wheel death with multiple options. We have some new ones on here. Um, and basically, Bittner, give that thing a big old spin. And uh, right, my my the one I hope it lands on is the new one. Is uh, you got to do the ABCs with the shock collar on the neck. Oh no! So um, what? And you don't know when you're gonna get shocked. Yeah, you don't know when you get shocked. We're gonna do a lower setting. Okay. But other ones, uh, foot race and Crocs. Um, Things of that nature. So give it a spin. See what see what we land on. Give it a hard spin, not like a spin. Yeah, give yeah. it a good spin. Give it a crank. Yep. Good spin. Good spin. It's got a good spin to it. It's a long. What does it say? Ooh, bomb bomb hole donates. donates. I like that. Two hundred. Right out of our pocket. Uh, do you That's have any? Good, do you have any charities or things that we should uh, donate? We're gonna do a it's bomb your hole choice. Bomb hole donates two hundred dollars to a charity or nonprofit of your choice. All right. I think since I'm wearing the hat, we got to go. Donate to the SLCA. It's uh, Salt Lake Climbers Alliance. They support the local climbing scene in and around Salt Lake City and in all, in all the canyons. They continue to lobby for better access for climbing. Um, they do a lot of route maintenance and bolt maintenance, keeping everything safe and keeping everybody safe. They do a ton of trail maintenance, so they kind of work with the comp- other cons- conservation um people and different canyons and stuff to kind of help direct people to where climbing is so people aren't just trampling all sorts of stuff they build trails they do a ton of really good stuff for the rock climbing community and and taking care of the canyons so it's a non-profit yep Shoot, that. that's yeah. perfect and that's you know we kind of owe it to him we've been making fun of rock climbing a lot yeah. so i think it's, it's good. nice nice to give it'll back. be nice to give yep. back um Here you guys making fun of rock climbing yeah we, so uh <laughs> one thing we were, we're talking about stone out though we were talking about getting buds going because he had a great he had a great idea for going climbing and what you said i don't want to rock climb but i do want to do I, something. I do want to sleep in one of those uh sleeping bags as high as possible where they uh basically they put in their tents right i mean you must have to install your own tent oh yeah it's called a port ledge so you basically you're hanging from anchors that are drilled into the wall. It's like bolts in the wall. And you hang your your ledge from the anchors, and you either sleep right on the ledge or you have, like, a tent that goes around it. I want to sleep in the dangler well, you know, about 1,000 feet up. You know, he's a, he's, he's a sleepwalker. You know that, Yeah, right? I'm a sleepwalker. Yeah, well. So that's going to be a bit of a, that's gonna be a, bit of a so, problem. So, yeah, I'm thinking when I sleepwalk, I'll just wake up and hopefully be in the harness and be like, oh. just see dangling we'll off just the tie side you of down. We'll just tie your arms and feet together and yeah. keep you tied down. I see those down. photos of people doing it, and I'm always just amazed. We might have to I get a, do a straight jacket for him in a harness. Yeah. It's on my bucket list. We'll keep you in a harness. We'll keep you tied in. I've never done that, too, so that's also on. Oh, you can come. Come, let's on do my it. bucket list and on my wife's bucket list. Well, we can. He'll probably be like rummaging through the bed. Like, like one, he might be rummaging. <laughs> I'll be trying to find the snack. He's tent. gonna try to find yeah. a, Like, you might hear him eating like a bag of chips at four in the morning, dead asleep, something like that. You know, it's a three day trip and all the snacks are gone day one. 
<laughs> well, other things in the like morning, so you, you wake up, I'm in your tent with you and the wife. <laughs> Just totally rehooked up in the <laughs> ropes. Oh my god, we got to do that. Spider Man Sleepwalker. <laughs> He's trying to make a pot of coffee somehow with the wrong coffee and brewing tent. coffee with the wrong with thing. a jet boil. <laughs> yeah. Dead asleep. He's sleeping. <laughs> hey, let's go climb a single pitch somewhere first. See if you can get off the ground. Nope, I'm starting with the most serious <laughs> aggro crag. We'll have to repel in. I like yeah, to do it big. Yeah, we're going big. So yeah, Let's we're big. It. We're Let's big supporters it. of the climbing community now. <laughs> Bomb hole. Yeah, Climb. we're huge supporters of the <laughs> community. We we donate money. <laughs> All right, we got two hundred bucks coming your way. SLCA. I'm losing yes. my mind. <laughs> you got it though. That was good. You nailed it. <laughs> Either that or a foot race. <clears throat> okay, one thing we almost forgot is the pub beer breakout moment. Uh, you know, if you're going to crush some candy, you're going to want to throw a few back, get loose, get yourself a pub beer. I'll, I'll tell you what, I uh, I brought Dead Lung an 18 pack the other day. Guess what he did? He made it a zero pack. He, uh, yeah, made a zero pack, crushed some damn cans. I love that. Dead Cheap, lung. fun beer. And uh, yeah, he crushed pretty much all of them zero pack, like you're saying. Yeah. So if you want, it's, we recommend it. If you want to take an 18 pack, make it a zero pack, get yourself some pub beer. They support us. You should support them. Now, we're going to make this one a two-parter here, Bittner. So uh, the, the original question we always ask is, what was the breakout moment in your career? And then we're going to add a part two to that, which is, who's your favorite pro snowboarder to party with? So, uh, yeah, go ahead. All right. Breakout moment. We kind of already went over pyramid gap and, like, my finger on the trigger part, moment of truth, and getting to start shooting with Mac Dog. But... Another kind of breakout moment I could think of it real off the top of my head would be my follow me around part uh, in the MDP movie. After that part, that's when I started getting like some pretty heavy calls and, and started to like actually start to see like, maybe I'm going to have the opportunity to make some real cheddar biscuits in this, in this biz. So, um, yeah, good and bad, you know, good and bad with that kind of created some, some tension between some of my sponsors and myself and having to deal with like kind of fielding these offers and trying to decide what's best for me and what's best for my friends and what's going to kind of ultimately be the best decision to kind of have some longevity in my career and be able to have something to show for it later on. So, um, yeah, I was like maybe 23 at the time and pretty young to be like dealing with the stresses of that side of things like that's kind of when snowboarding became more of like oh oh shit this is like a real business and i have to like make some serious decisions and and some of these decisions are going to hurt people and it's going to hurt me and it's stressful and not super fun so that's kind of another kind of breakout moment that i can't complain about but it was hard and having to quit tech nine quit some of my sponsors that i was like long time friends with and had helped me so much in my career was like kind of devastating to me like it was it was either like I'm gonna be I'll be bummed either way I'm like screwed kind of like I'm in a great spot and snowboarding's going great but I'm kind of like gonna have to burn some relationships and and put myself in a position where like it, it kind of like I have to go one way or the other and it was just a real tough stressful time to like be dealing with that and the options were you you're riding tech nine snowboards but then you got a big head to toe offer from DC. Yeah, I got offers from like Forum, Burton, DC. We're all kind of like coming to the table pretty hard and and coming with some real substantial biscuits. And it was like, you know, going from kind of barely getting by, paying my rent, being fine to like actually having like the opportunity to like stack some money and save some money and you know, maybe buy a house someday or, you know, just be able to support myself and my goals in my career to be able to travel, to be able to like film in different places and be able to like push my career further. So, and, you know, Tech Nine was so supportive and everybody was trying so hard to try to figure out how we could make, make it work and trying to figure out like how I could make it work with other sponsors to kind of get to the same level of like support that I was getting offered. But it just, you know, when DC came to the table after I'd already gotten some other offers from, from like Burton and the program, um, 
kind of felt like I'd already been riding for DC too. So I was like considering that year kind of stopping Oakley outerwear and riding DC outerwear and DC boots and getting a better deal from them. And then it kind of came up, which was also kind of like kind of tough to deal with was like, they they were going to make boards, but it was top secret. So we're going to sign you guys for full head to toe, but you're not allowed to tell anybody what boards you're riding. So that was like a full season of that. Like you got to quit your sponsors, but you can't tell anybody you're riding DC boards until we actually come out with boards. So that whole next season I was like riding kind of random boards, testing stuff. And, and it was kind of a secretive kind of operation and it was cool, but it kind of sucked and it sucked to have to quit tech nine. Honestly, that was like, that was tough, dude. Yeah, that was tough. That was tough on all of us for sure. I was pretty supportive of you, but not everybody was. Yep. And uh, at the end of the day, do you feel like you made to say the right decision? Yeah, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I could have, I could have maybe tried to juggle things a little bit better, but Burton and Farm, was, though, man, those are big companies coming in at you too. Yeah, they were, they were better deals, um, to be honest. Oh, really? Yeah, but it meant I had to quit riding for Oakley and quit mm. riding for Celtech and all these sponsors that I felt like you had to leave I everybody. Had so much loyalty to all my sponsors. It was really tough to have to like consider just being like, I'm going to throw all my eggs in one basket and be done with all my sponsors. Everybody that like helped me get to this point, I'm just going to bail on them. It was like a horrible feeling to have to consider that. And when DC came to the table and I had been talking to them too, cause I was like, dude, if I get on one of these guys, I'm gonna have to quit DC as well. And the coolest thing about DC was the mountain lab to me, like being able to drive 15 minutes up Parley's and be at the mountain lab. And we had our own little like snowboard heaven. Yeah. It was like, did you have a locker up there? I did. did. A- after I got on the pro team, I didn't for, for when I was like am squad, but if you guys have, yeah, have we all got lockers. It, go ahead and watch DC mountain lab video. Type it on YouTube. It's a great mm-hmm. project, but yeah, that place was incredible. If you that was around ring. now, it'd you be got like the ring too, right? Yep. I should have worn that ring. The DC brought, ring? Yeah. yeah. Still got it in my safe at home. And you're safe. And where's your house? <laughs> like, get up on that safe. Any I know more of those cracker. bars? You got any more, yeah, you got any more gold bars in there? They're, I, 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 I read up. The gold bars are worth 2000 a pop right now. I lost one. Yeah, he I, lost I a made it, You I, drill a hole in one? I made a necklace out of it. I had somebody like solder, like put a piece of gold, like a gold loop on it and made oh, the necklace. Oh, you didn't drill it? No. And Eddie Wall made a necklace too, so that's like what gave me the idea. Is like I want a necklace. That'd be sick, like medallion or and, a gold bar. And then I lost it. I don't know where I lost it, or how I lost it, or who stole it, or what. Someone happened, came up on two G's. Yeah. That sounds like more of a stole than a loss. Yeah, it sounds like a stole. Possibly, yep. Yeah. It's a valuable piece. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll find it in a pocket or in a backpack or something someday. I keep be keeping sick. my fingers crossed. But yeah. Okay, one thing with the Tech Nine stuff, you know. Uh, you see it with other brands. A lot of times I'll say Nitro is a brand like this. A lot of times you see uh, smaller brands that that kind of are like the farm team where they 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 take a rider, they fi- a rep finds them at a young age, they groom them, they come up with them, and then a big old brand like Forum or, you know, brands like that come through and then swoop them up. And, and is, you know, it's awesome. It's it's But it's, it's frustrating I'm sure for you, buds, being an owner of Tech Nine, yeah, for us it and was for a Cole, problem. And it, it's mm. got to be, it's got to be hard. And but as a rider, what do you do? You you got to make your money while you can because it doesn't last. Yeah. So from a brand perspective, how's that? And then ha- from the rider perspective, I mean, you're kind of touched on it, but for us, we were trying to not be that farm team anymore. You know, Cole really wanted to bring people up and keep them because we had so many people come through the ranks. But then we were finally able to do that with Bradshaw and Gooner. They re, they stood with us and and Marco and and so it finally started to work out. But we can't compete with these offers from DC being the smaller brand, you know. And, mm-hmm. and Cole was so passionate as as you know. So for him, it was such a bummer to put so much into riders and then have them move on. But the way I saw it, it's just, just going to happen, man. There's what are you going to do? I wanted the best for the riders because we we were all friends. So to me, when I see someone Bittner, someone like Bittner get a deal like that, it's like that's amazing, man. Well, take that money. You know, it's amazing. Money, you know? Whatever, whether there was feelings that were hard feelings or not, you fast forward 17 years later, yep. you know, and this dude's <laughs> out, out there again with the whole gang is back together. And it was, it was kind of beautiful. Yeah, sense. it was nice. So, it was yeah, fun that was getting the crew together. And those were honestly some of the best memories of my career. Can't, can't discount that at all. Like those were 
the most simple amazing times just, just getting after like, it and stacking let's see those what shots. we can get and like just so psyched to be filming a video with you guys and and being on tech nine and being close to having a pro model with tech yeah this nine. board never came out actually yeah this board right here that was the year everything went down yeah, we made samples and then the deal offer came yep which was tough financially i was, <laughs> I was looking forward to this that, I worked that was on a this financial too. Like, shot right yeah there. <laughs> sorry about that for real like it's all good it was now. such a yeah. Such one, a crazy one thing time. cool about Cole is how he instills that work ethic too. So that was always probably a good thing for all the kids that came up and Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Let's give a big old air horn to Cole. Yeah. Big shout out to Cole. <laughs> big shouts. And what are you gonna do? Kids it's gonna happen with any team. Happens nowadays to everybody, people. Yeah, people I think I on, you know. I stressed out about it probably more than I should have. But yeah, I remember it was gnarly. We were was, like talking to your dad. We were talking to you. It was, it was yeah, insane. It was crazy. Like it, it kind of drove me nuts for a little bit. And knowing like at twenty three, all my friends, all my best friends are on Tech Nine. Like everybody I day to day rode with and hung out with, they're all on Tech Nine. And it kind of yeah, it created some animosity for a little while with like yeah. a lot of my best friends. Not like it was like blackballed from the crew, but it kind of made it so like yeah, it wasn't wasn't the same it was definitely tough for a little bit but in time you know time you know who your real friends wounds, are right? and stuff and it's all good well there's a part two to that question which is uh who's your favorite snowboarder to party with um eastone is one of them for sure <laughs> i'm not a pro snowboarder i know but <laughs> might dude, as well be though <laughs> might as well be when you get eastone I don't know if you've ever heard eastone do his like oh, I've rasta heard. freestyle <laughs> lithuania i seen it where, where are you seen it at I don't even know where we were at. Who Maybe knows? I don't know, but yeah. And the, and when he was around, I was probably doing a lot more. So yeah. Oh my God, those were the those were the best. <laughs> um, J two. So just before we breeze past, uh, Bud's getting possessed by some type of reggae god. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you explain what happens when he gets possessed? He turns into he can like freestyle like he's Jamaican. <laughs> <laughs> he turns into a Jamaican. I he, swear, I honestly get possessed. <laughs> yeah. Buds gets possessed by a Jamaican god of sorts, and uh, uh -huh. and he, he like he doesn't just try; he like kills it. It's <laughs> fucking crazy. It's mind blowing. <laughs> like it's funny too. I need like a crowd usually, <laughs> yeah. and an actual mic. Like the bigger the crowd, the better. I think the last time I saw you do that was at Mount Hood. Like oh, at, that hood! I remember the Eddie Wall mags. was there. Eddie Wall and I were on the mic. It was like the next next top pro model or something. Yeah, that was amazing. That was a good sesh. <laughs> yep. But yeah, I need a crowd and yep. and a microphone like to make it and really a few, really come the for the possession to really come real. Few cases of pub beers. Yeah, some pub beers <laughs> and it's on. Crush a couple cans and he's ready to go. Other favorite pros. I mean, had a pretty wild night out randomly in Japan with David Benedict and Mike Bassich. Did a full night of. Of karaoke in Japan, that was pretty awesome. A lot of memorable memorable parties with Devin Walsh and Ika, Lowry, the whole DC team. Um, yeah, a lot of lot of legends. J two was always the life of the party, spinning music and mm -hmm. making sure everybody's just having a good time. Marco, some legendary parties with Marco back in the day. Unspeakable things were happening. <laughs> We don't want this show to be getting taken off of uh, YouTube. Let's let's make sure we don't talk about this. Uh, I think it could be a good time for some hot takes. Hot takes. Okay, uh, we're going to start implement, uh, you know, we like to ask the MJ of snowboarding or the goat, if you will. And we're going to do male and female version of goat. Who you got? Wow, female. Aaron Comstock. Best style. First first one we've heard on the show, and I like it. I like yeah. that, too. Aaron killed it. Yeah, Aaron was awesome. She was also a Tech 9 teammate back in mm -hmm. the day. But, yeah, shout out to Aaron Comstock. Um, yeah, my goats, I mean, I'm not thinking about contests or championship rings, stuff like that. Like, people that I looked up to, style that was, like, the most iconic is, like, Mark Frank Montoya once again, Devin Walsh, J.P. Walker. All those guys were, like, style that you want to that made me want to emulate their style or try to do those tricks and everything looked so smooth and effortless like falling marco around snowbird is still like to this day one of the most mind-blowing things you can see he can go slower than everybody and pop way higher and go further somehow it just goes way bigger 
And like, yeah, he's probably got the most pop out of any snowboarder. Absolutely. Ever. Following yeah. him on the high speed roller. Yeah. Woo. Just he'd fly like a hundred feet off that. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I got a curveball for you. Would you consider Stony Hawk a goat? Stony Hawk. Yeah. Would you consider him a goat? Which one? The your bong. The, the bong. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I definitely would not. That was, that was a, that was a great, great part of my life for a little bit there, but not the goat. Not, a goat. not okay. the greatest bong no. of all time. No. Yeah. Yep. That was, that was fun, but glad I outgrew that phase. So another question we got for hot takes is if you had a Hollywood actor play your role in life, who would it be? Oh yeah. Back to that. We, so we had Rob Schneider would be my comedy version. I would love to see how he'd play me and what kind of fun he'd make of me and if it had to be serious dramatic be like Heath Ledger or maybe some sort of super legendary actor like I don't know are I don't know who do a good job are we going Heath Ledger Brokeback Mountain or Batman <laughs> oh Brokeback Mountain for sure oh, no Batman <laughs> Batman <laughs> so, who's that's, that so we have our own uh Bud's Bud's found this take yeah. wow um so explain who this is Bud. this is from Sex in the City that right there is Carrie Bradshaw in the show, and that's her boyfriend. Um, Aiden is his name, and I always thought you looked like this, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so you you watch Sex in the City, dude? I got a wife, man. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was kind of I was kicking tires with buds. I'm like, who we got for his uh, celebrity? You know, who would play his role in life? That's he's pretty like, good. He's like, I don't know this boyfriend from Sex in the City that dates the main character. <laughs> So we Googled it, and I think it's pretty spot on. Yeah, did it's he pretty always, good. He, the hairline's yeah, good. That, it's all like... He couldn't just, figure out the guy's like name. You. We couldn't figure out his name. But uh, Carrie's but boyfriend. Carrie's boyfriend in Sex of the City. All right. Yeah, I thought that was a quality one. Uh, another I'm, thing... I'm a huge fan of Sex in the yeah, City. It's actually all right. quality uh, TV. I'm not going right, to deny a, I've, <laughs> I've watched a few... Uh, <laughs> I've watched I've a bit of it. I've seen the movie. They got the movie. Yeah, the movie. Oh, yeah, maybe I saw the movie. It's a throwback now. We got to dig that one up and binge watch it. Okay, another uh, hot take. What do you? What's your take on the the beaver slap and the lift line to, when you're whacking your your board on the snow there? Um, sometimes I do it. I don't. I don't like having a ton of snow on my top sheet when I get on the chair, hanging on my knee, hanging on my ankle. Like as long as you're not being obnoxious, you should be able to slap your board down a couple times. Okay. He was but, also at Snowbird, man. They don't do that. The bird. The tram. There's, you know, no the tram. Yeah, There's no slapping. Yeah, definitely not. Going How down. do you get the snow off your board? If you yeah, can't maybe slap. I'm just you just pick your, your carry your board up the tram. Oh, okay. And clean yeah. it. Take your take both bindings off and brush it off with your hand, and then carry it through the line and get on the tram. See, what I would do is I would establish ultimate alpha male dominance, and I would go over the head slap like uh, <laughs> chopping a piece of wood style, <laughs> and just do a real aggressive like let everybody know you're there. I think we should go to the bird and uh, make that happen. Ultimate <laughs> ultimate beaver slap, think, yeah. yeah. Beaver slap in the tram line. On yeah, the in the concrete. tram line oh, yeah. when it's really long on the weekend. Yeah, and it goes out to the plaza. Everybody will rubberneck for sure. Oh yeah, just let that thing echo. <laughs> okay, also, uh, you know, let's say you're commuting to, um, you know, from the parking lot to the resort. Are you are you grabbing your board by your heel cup and just kind of letting it drag on the pavement, or are you, are you carrying that thing? I carry it. Oh, you do? You don't yeah. hit the edge drag? Not unless it's like, I mean, I used to do that with my jib boards and stuff when I didn't really care about my edges, but if I'm going to go ride park, I'm scared of park rails. I don't want to have any dings on my edge that I could get hung up on and eat shit on some icy park Good, rails or something. So. She's not dragging edge, but he's real no. tall too. It's a longer for me. It's just almost right there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's lower true. to the ground, lower center, of lower gravity. center of gravity. The edge is just it's easier on, to drag on the ground pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Some, if you haven't hit a drag in a while, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's definitely invigorating. Yeah. I'll, I did it. I'll drag in the snow, good. but oh, you'll on do snow concrete, drag? I don't do the drag too much unless it's like, yeah. I mean, I haven't been hitting handrails in, a, in quite a while too. So, the drag I mean, it is maybe maybe when I was hiking rails at Rail Garden I was dragging a bit, but <laughs> okay. Uh, I know you got a good answer for this. Worst trend, easy easy one. Reverse camber. Okay. I hate those wow. things. I can't believe they started making boards and they caught on like they did. But there's some people pulling their hair out listening to this right now. Yeah, man. Yeah, we well, get hate mail about that pretty much. We might oh. actually get like a um like a piece of like. What do they used to send in the mail that was that dust that they oh, tried to get everybody? Dust, yeah. Somebody, <laughs> oh, yeah, anthrax. Somebody's going to send us some anthrax because of that. <laughs> send us anthrax. They're like, I love reverse camper. I can't believe you're saying that. Sorry, yeah, continue. I mean, it doesn't help your style, like riding a reverse camper board. You can 
you can learn how to ride on a reverse camber. I think it's pretty forgiving to like learn how to link turns and stay on the ground. But as soon as you start hitting rails or having to do anything where you have to pop or like put down the landing gear where you're not fully squared up on hard snow, I think those things have zero support. Like I tried to ride them. We all got encouraged to turn our pro model boards on DC. Yeah, everyone wanted you to do it. Huh? Every company had to do it. Yeah. Once the skate banana came out, it was like, all of a sudden, everybody needs these boards. All the salespeople all over everywhere were just like, you have to have reverse camber if you want to sell boards. And That's just like what happened. So my pro model, I was told like, you can either turn your board into a reverse camber board. We'll make you a regular camber board to ride with your graphic. But the one that is being sold in stores is going to be a reverse camber. Ooh. So I was like promoting a reverse camber board while riding a re normal camber board. And then having to explain that to people, they're like, dude, your board sucks this year. <laughs> and like, how that do you ride it? Like, how do you do lot. that? Yeah, it does, huh? Yeah, dude. so that was just, that was a tough, tough thing to deal with in snow. Like, as a pro and somebody who is promoting a product for a brand, trying to do my job, but also, you know, not be like inauthentic to like, my following and people that want to buy my stuff like it's it false was, advertising it was really yeah, they tough. believe yeah. in you right it's yeah fun. it was it was a huge bummer that was like the first big slap in the face that this is just like all a big business and it's all run by money and it was after dc got sold to quicksilver too like right after that so quicksilver owned libtech at the time and it was like why don't you guys just use libtech and make all dc boards at libtech now and we were like the whole team was like, no way. Like we tried riding those boards and they're not going to work for us. Like wow. maybe they work for other people somehow, but they for us, we were like, yeah. But no, I that will makes say sense. the hybrid yeah. camber, they have some good versions of that. Yeah. But yeah, straight reverse camber. They've tweaked it a bunch. So, yeah. I mean, back in the day when reverse camber just became the hot shit, it was, that was a big bummer for me. Yeah, yeah. I think well, for a lot of people. Regardless, people should find what board works for them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if a reverse camber works for you, and that's the board that you feel the best on, ride that fucker. If you yep. like a stiff, regular camber, ride that fucker. If you like a hybrid camber, ride it. It doesn't matter. But the one thing I do think is fucked up, which you see a lot of brands, I will not mention any names, but like tons and tons of brands are taking... Well, they want a certain rider that rides park to be on their park specific board, right? So they're taking and that maybe that rider wants a stiffer or softer board. So they're taking a completely different board and putting a different graphic on it. And then so you're like, oh, my God, I want to ride that board. And they're like, well, that's just the board they want to sell you. That's not the board they're on. So mm -hmm. like it's an interesting it's an interesting dynamic you see when you peel the curtain back about brands kind of false advertising the board's. Yeah, that happens behind closed doors a mm -hmm. lot more than you'd expect. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lot of brands will happily do that for you. If you want to ride a different board, you got to have a certain graphic on it. If you're getting paid the dollars to be on the team, they're using you as a marketing tool. So that's part of the business that you don't know until you get there. But yeah, um, yeah that's, that's one of the worst trends, just being honest. I mean, do your thing, have fun. It's not that serious anyways. We're just snowboarding, but... That's something that bummed me out, so got to mention that. We can also talk about just the way people look. I mean, I come from a different time and different style and stuff, but tight pants, when tight pants kind of took over, I just couldn't get with that style too. But once again, do your thing, whatever makes you feel comfortable and good when you look down and you see your feet on your board and you're just stoked to go ride, that's cool. But tight pants and front board pretzels were also... Another thing. Ooh, that might, I never I could, liked front board pretzels. <clears throat> See, I think some people are going to be triggered listening to this. You They're, know what, though? Take L&P. Could you imagine him in baggy pants? It just doesn't work. Nope. There's definitely certain people couldn't imagine in, in baggy pants. Even Justin say, Hebel, looking back at, like, Well, he did baggy for a little bit. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> and then, yeah. I got to take on <clears throat> front board pretzels if we're going to get on the intricacies. Of yeah, let's hear your guys' opinions on front board pretzels. So I think I think a front board pretzel can look really good. Or it's actually a, it's an or back lip pretzel. Like you take somebody like Lewif, the way he does it, or certain people that can, for example, uh, Jed back lip pretzeling that triple kink, right? It, it yes, was, it, was, it was natural. There's okay. some mentionable, really properly done ones, and can't hate on those at all. Pretz, front board pretzels for me, 
were always forced. It felt completely forced and didn't feel like, like it was a good trick for me. Like it didn't feel good. So I just didn't like doing them. And I don't like watching them when they look forced. Yeah. If they don't look forced and they're smooth and like somebody just naturally can do that really well, then that's awesome. Great but, argument. Yeah. And a tendency you see a lot with that trick is people, when you put in a front board, you want that shit to be 90. You want it to be square. You want it to be good. You don't want, and, and a lot of times you'll see people put it in, we'll call it 45, where mm-hmm. in order to get the pretzel around, you're you're not fully put yeah, in the like front board up. up. So so you're like, you always see like dog shit front board to pretzel. That's a classic uh, uh, thing that's not fun to watch. Yeah, it's so like saggy because they're cocked or something, right? Do your shit, do your right. Yeah, people, there's certain people for sure you've seen like they can pop out, like actually pop off and mm-hmm. pretzel out and land like on their toes and like mm-hmm. yep. stomp it smooth, not like... Force it out, slip out off the end of the rail, oh and land God. on your heels, and like I'm, I'm sorry, buds, but the early Tech Nine days, <laughs> that, those videos may be notables for some bad. That's front probably board why I don't like them because <laughs> yeah. they've gotten like the better. Tech. They've gotten better over the years. Like, but the, when they perfected fir- them, when they first hit the the scene, those things were like you're landing on your heel edge and sliding it around, and you're like, dude, you ain't, you didn't. That's not a me. <laughs> but those, we'll put some it in of there. the kids from Canada, the Quebec kids. I don't remember. I don't want to name names. I guess. Yeah, you already kn- you already said we, too we, much. I've yeah, said too much. Said too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know which Quebec was. They're legends. Though. They're legends. Let's give them an air horn, even though they just got roasted. Uh, and we're talking about first gen, or maybe like earlier gen. Yeah, than early than gen. gen. I so. mean, at the time it was. Should we just say some fucking names? Yeah, or? Max Legend Andre. Yeah, those ones are a little. Uh, Jan Dolphin, love you guys. Legends, yeah. legends, legends. For, not guys, not the sure. best front board pretzels I've ever seen. That's okay. We can say that. Um, they are champions. So it's uh it's time for you know what, buds. Uh name that video part. Oh shit, here we go. I'd love that little jingle just Let's throw a quick air that. horn to uh, Max Lynch and Day and Yan Dauphin, because I know Yan watches the show. Yeah. Uh yeah, also yeah. I want to say Yan and Max, I'm A still a huge fan. B gigantic. Gigantic fan growing up. Yeah. So, you, you mm-hmm. know. And I love you dudes. This episode of uh, the podcast, this name that video part, if you will, uh, this segment is unofficially sponsored by one of the coolest brands out there today. Uh, if you haven't heard of Dover Hats, I was wearing one last episode, I believe, or recently. And uh, this is Danny Cass's beanie company. It's called Dover Danny is, was kind of not in the mix for a little while. He kind of was away from snowboarding, and he's back, and he is one of uh, snowboarding's most valuable treasures, and he started Dover. And if you want to support a cool fucking snowboarder, go on Dan. I don't know what his website is. It's called their Dover Hats. You can find the link on his Instagram. Buy a Dover hat and support Danny Cass because Danny Cass is the fucking man. Now, um, to name that video part. So, what's your confidence zero through ten, Bittner? I mean, maybe a five at the most. Okay, middle middle of the road. I don't know. Depends on that's uh, high for a lot of people that sit in that seat. So, yeah, well, we'll see how I feel after this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we go. You're a video park guy, so there's kind of a lot of pressure riding on this. Oh, my God. I have another hint if you need it to, but let's see if you can squirm around and come up with that answer. I can't. I can't. I know that song, too. I can kind of picture it, but... I'll give it again. Play it one more time. Oh, I can't. I can't do it. Give me another hint. Here's your hint. Here we go. That was the funnest thing. It was like touchdown landings. So it's a Devin Walsh part. Kind of. It's kind of a Devin Walsh part, but yeah. Or well, was it, that him talking? It's a Devin Walsh was part. Was it a... We'll call it... Was it Devin? That was the funest thing. It was like was it like down landing. Oh, was him it a, and other people. It's a Devin Walsh part. We'll call it a Devin Walsh part. Was it in a movie or was it a... Was it like a it was, video series? It was in a movie that was not your conventional movie, we'll say. Was it Polar Opposites? Nope. No. It was... That's uh, That is from the DC Mountain Lab video. And oh, remember they're hitting the A-frame a thing. Yeah. And I don't know why. That I, I always. Known, I should have known that was a Pierre Wickberg 
pick too. Yep. It's a yeah, Pierre. I give you an air horn, but we're not on that soundboard. That's like I don't know. We would always quote that. It's like touchdown landing. He's hitting a yeah. frame doing gap back lips. Yeah, but um, I can't believe I. So you got that a, one. Uh, well, you said Devin Walsh. You got yeah, there. Okay. Yeah, you got a participation award. Uh, you yes. did not actually win this. You just started receiving it. Okay. Everybody gets one. Yeah, everybody gets one. Sweet. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> so you did again. Didn't win it. Uh, you just Still received got it. it. <laughs> but uh, um, and it's filled with merch that you can only get at bombhole.com. XL bomb hole shirt. What do we got in there? We got a big, nice burgundy mug. Probably oh, a Stony yeah. Buds air freshener. Some stickers. Nice. Look at that. Um, well, thank you. Get nope. all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, might, maybe stickers. Some, some shorts. I don't know. We actually, uh, we may or may not potentially have some bomb hole sniffing salts coming so- soon. So uh, yes. keep your eye out for those. We got some new beanies. Tall resi beanies. Uh, new hats <clears> are looking <throat> good. All that stuff. Go check out our new hats at bombhole.com. And, uh, you know. If you like the podcast, uh, helps us keep being two two idiots in a garage, really. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, so yeah, that's definitely pretty doesn't, three. It doesn't help keep the uh, garage cold. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can't quite afford a good uh, <laughs> cooling system yet, but we're getting there. But maybe we, we sell some more merch. We might get a couple there. more hats. We yeah. might be uh, not sweating our uh, ball sack off. So yeah. it's All right, insulated part- better than my garage. True, it is insulated. He insulated it. Um, too bad we live in the goddamn Sahara Desert. So uh, so part two of Name That Video part is for the listeners. If you know the part, comment on the photo of Aaron Bittner when this episode comes out. And we're on it with our prize packs now. If you're the first person to guess and you know the part and you're the first person to comment, you will get a prize pack from us. So here we go. Let's hit it. Okay. No clue. <clears throat> so we're going to get a Patreon question for you. Legendary parts that I always looked forward to with all the Mac Dog flicks got me stoked to snowboard. What was one of the most memorable Mac Dog sessions you ever had? And that's from Gromit Goes. I'd have to maybe throw it back to like the first trip. Like my first trip with Mac Dog being my first trip overseas, basically out of the out of North America, um, went to Finland, and I think the first spot, the first or second spot we went to was this, was this big long drop off rail, and we set it up, set our drop in ramp up. Hakey Sorsa had just shown up as well. I think he took us there. And it was at like a big Nokia building. So Nokia is based out of Finland. And we're at this building, getting ready to hit this rail. And two security guards come up to me. I'm on top of the drop and ramp. Kid from Utah in Finland on a drop and ramp. These guys are yelling at me in Finnish. And I'm just like, I don't, I, I'm sorry, I speak English. Like, do you guys speak English? And they spoke okay English, pretty good English. And I was like, hold on really quick. Let me go get my friend who's from Finland. So I go and get Heiki. We walk back up and talk to these guys. And as soon as they saw him, they were just like, oh, wow, like Heiki Sorsa. Like, we know you from the Olympics, and you're, like, famous. And he just talked to them for a minute and finished, and they are like, yeah, just go ahead and hit the rail. So we went from getting kicked out, like, you can't do this here, to Heiki being like, it's cool now. We're good. I'm like, holy shit. Like, Heiki Sorsa, rock He's star. A damn legend. We were talking about that the other day. This is the mindset in Finland compared to the U.S. It's just so different towards snowboarding and winter sports. And yeah, the fact no... that they knew who he was, you know. And I mean, he was just to to their defense, too. He went to the Olympics, he had a gigantic mohawk, and he was going huge. Yeah, that was true, one of the most huh? punk mm-hmm. rock legendary things that was ever awesome. done in snowboarding. So shouts to Heiki. I've been on a rail session where we're sitting there and. Uh, People are yelling at apartment windows at J.P. Walker, though, like, yeah. oh, you're J.P. Walker. And they came For out sure. and made us tea in mid-session. Mm-hmm. That's you so just see sick. that stuff. In, in that. Were you doing all night sessions, too? That was during the day. Uh, but we did a lot of night sessions, you too. You slip into the night moves at that place. Yeah, there was that was during, the, like, a little bit of daylight. We only had a little. It was, like, December, so it was only uh-huh. a few hours of kind of, like, twilight, gray kind of daylight, and then it was night sessions, so. We would try. We tried for a few days to make some day, day sessions happen, but we ended up doing a fair amount at you night get like too. Like four hours as the sun just skirts the horizon. Yeah, but it wasn't too early. I don't. I don't think too. It was like kind of afternoon when you had a few hours of light. So now I have a question dark. for you. Um, so 
you've had a shitload of video parts, long career. Which video part holds the dearest space in your heart and why? What's the most, your favorite part? It'd have to be one of the parts that I actually got to like pick the music for and stuff. So moment of truth is huge. That was my first real, like, like real mainstream video part. And then, yeah, my first Mac dog part was huge too. I was kind of bummed that I didn't have any jump shots, didn't have good enough jump shots. Basically that was kind of a, a rude awakening too. like being told like, yeah, we, you got some jump shots that are pretty good, but they're on the same jumps of, as like arrow and, you see and Jeremy and all these guys that are stomping like crazy tricks. And I'm like, okay, I get it now. Like I'm not bummed at all. <laughs> like, my Did they pull you suck. in the studio or call you? And yeah, I went out to the edit and like sat in the edit while they were editing my part and, and had to get that rude awakening. <laughs> I, it was just kind of not like a rude awakening really. Like I didn't know what I was expecting, but it's just kind of hoping not to be only rails. But my first video part with them was only rails yeah. and spent the second half of the season filming jumps and learning how to snowmobile and, you know, I kind of knew how to sled, but I just bought a pretty shitty sled and tried trying to keep up with everybody. And long days filming was it's a it's a grind. So just learning the process and stuff was was tough. And spent a lot of time in the backcountry and didn't have anything to show for it. So I was like, okay, gotta like gotta step it up next season and the thing that spend a little more time being ready. It's definitely interesting to hear that because by the time you and I spent a winter together filming and uh, with Bjorn and we did. Uh, that nothing to prove year, we kind of maybe we were on different street missions, but we linked up for the whole backcountry part of the year. And dude, I remember watching you jump that year. It was, I still to this day will like tell anybody that was the highest landing percentage I've ever seen of anybody hitting jumps. And I don't know. So it's interesting to yeah. hear. I mean, I guess you see, and those guys are building jackers. We were just building normal yeah, the jumps, size wedges. So. Jumps weren't super massive. Um, Definitely had a few more years under my belt of of hitting lots of jumps. And that year was fun because, yeah, we got to just go build jumps that we wanted to hit, not necessarily just like we got to build crazy gaps and gigantic death-defying jumps. It was more like let's just go see what kind of tricks we can get. And, and yeah, it worked out pretty good. But, yeah, that's kind of just a lucky year too, just kind of feeling pretty solid on my board and felt like I could just land stuff. I wasn't trying the craziest tricks or anything, but – just try one trick if I landed it just have to try another trick until the landing was gone so it's nice when you can put a few down and then maybe try something a little harder and try to get a a better trick but that's Uh, kind of the process anyways like try to land basic tricks first and have those in the bank and then start trying for harder stuff that might get you hurt or something throughout your year and put together a better and better part as you go I, I do remember one thing I found fascinating that made no sense to me is like your back fives and your cab sevens which for people that are, don't know, like landing those tricks into powder are particularly hard the way you come into the landing for somebody. That would be like, <clears throat> that to me is like a back 270 to fakie on a rail or something. It's like a really technically hard trick on a powder jump. And those just seem to be your go-tos. Yeah, that goes back to Snowbird, I think, jumping off cat tracks and just trying to push myself. I rode with these dudes. Big shout out to Abe and Paul Horschel. Um <laughs> When I was young, like 16 probably, when they kind of took me under their wing. A couple of guys I really looked up to a ton back then, and they were kind of homies with the big dogs up there too. So we'd see them talking to like the big big dog riders that would come through sometimes, like Bjorn and MFM and stuff. But they kind of like would go out and ride with, with me and my friend Mats and take us out and kind of push us and be like, why do you do the same trick every run off that jump? Why don't you try something different? And I'm like, well, because I can't do that. Like, that's what you should be doing. Like, do tricks that that make you fall and learn how to do them. Like, Mm -hmm. do a cab three, do a cab seven or back five or or even spinning backside. I think they were like, if you spin frontside off everything, you're not going to get good at spinning backside. You got to, got to try different things and, and fail a bunch before you're going to get it right. So that was part of it. Like, I think Snowbird was the best for learning how to land in really shitty landings. Like, Mm -hmm. not necessarily shitty, but maybe not the steepest. Definitely not the smoothest. Choppy. Choppy. Soft enough to fall, but kind of hard to put it down and ride out. So you have to really know how to put your landing gear down and be able to ride through anything for a little bit before you slam the brakes on. So, yeah, that's that's a huge part. Dude, I'm going to kind of – I want to go off on a little tangent about you, what you just said there, because it's 
something I've been thinking about a lot in, 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 uh, in reality of, of, you know, why certain people are, are great at what they do and why some people aren't. And if I look at, you know, <clears throat> there's two ways to frame it. It's an interesting thing to, to talk about. I think we've, we breezed on this, but like you could say, let's just take somebody like, for example, Mark McMorris, right? He's, he's absolutely incredible at snowboarding. And I could mm-hmm. say, well, well, Mark is more incredible at snowboarding because he had more advantages than I did because he grew up and he got on Red Bull and they did these training camps and maybe he had a Canadian team coach. Maybe he had his brother to push him. Maybe whatever it is, maybe he, he had snowmobile toes from the Canadian national team to learn all these tricks, right? So I could sit there and I could say, Mark is better than me at snowboarding because he had more advantages, right? That's, that's an easy way to frame it. The reality of the situation is, Mark McMorris is better than me at snowboarding because he ceased every opportunity to learn new tricks as you're describing at Snowbird coming up. He, the reality of why Mark's better than me is because when I was comfortable staying at switchback five, because I'm going to do five of those because that feels good. He's falling on his head trying to learn switchback nines. And I just think that that's something that's really important. It's like, instead of, instead of saying, okay, this person has more advantages of, of them, it's like no matter what, if things aren't fair or not fair, and this is a conversation maybe more about accountability, you still are responsible for your own actions. And and I, I don't know why I'm going down this wormhole, but that just kind of sparked something for me there. No, I agree for sure. Like very rarely are you going to be good at something right away. Like sometimes once you're, once you've been doing something long enough, maybe it'll click or maybe you can just think about things in different smaller segments, but you can put it together really quickly. And other times, yeah, it's going to take a lot of failures and a lot of a lot of trial and error to get it right, to get it to feel the way you want it, to to take it to a bigger jump or take a you know a small little cat track jump, turn it into a big ass park jump. You're probably not going to be doing the same tricks all the time. Like huge props to the guys that are chucking like switch back nines or switch back twelves or all these crazy doubles and triples because that's that's a lot of trial and error and a lot of, a lot of eating shit before you get that right. I, I, I'm pretty sure like not, oh, yeah. not knowing how to do that, but oh, I've yeah. definitely taken my, my, uh, high percentage of, of hits over the years too. So mm-hmm. yeah, you gotta, you gotta be ready to, to pay the price to get, to get good at something like snowboarding. It's definitely not easy and you can't, you can't assume people just are automatically good at it. It takes mm-hmm. a lot of practice. Uh, that's great advice too. It's like try a, try a different trick every time you have to jump. Yeah, you got that one figured out. Don't keep doing it, you know. Mm-hmm. And and uh, that kind of falls along the lines of like we were we were talking earlier and randomly I didn't really know this and I I get you know we've talked about books on this show and uh, um I, I read and I hate the I hate the stigma around reading of like the intellectual like condescending ego that happens when people start to get smart so i try to steer clear <laughs> of being like i'm a book guy fucking check this book oh, out have you read but, this book yeah. like but also in the contrary like books are really beneficial and can and have helped me out a lot in my life and you're you you kind of as we were talking it sounds like we read a lot of the same stuff and um if you could recommend maybe a handful of books of things that you're into that have helped you out and why let fire away yeah i mean off the top of my head Like, Robert Greene is a great author. If you haven't read any of his stuff, like, pretty much pick up any of those books, and and there's you get something out of it for sure. Um, He really uh, dissects how humans, basically, why they tick and how they are the way they are. He's written uh, Mastery, 48 Laws of Power, Art of Seduction. All great Mm. books. Yeah. Yeah. Teach you about yourself and about other people. Kind of teaches you how to be, um, yeah, kind of better, just a more empathetic understanding person you know people there's a lot of differences we all have Mm -hmm. um so that's fun to learn about for me like it's fascinating to like learn about how people what makes people tick not just myself um same thing with like you know jocko willink is a great author we were talking about that like it's kind of corny to say but yeah he's got some really good points in a lot of his books as a high level high functioning military leader like that's not really what we come from as our background not at all but um some relatable sides to it for sure the book uh that you read is that extreme ownership Mm -hmm. yeah i would that's what i read as well and i would say that had a massive positive impact on my life i would say easy to read blew through it 
would definitely yeah. recommend. I'm not a military guy either, but it's like that's not my shit. But like yeah, it, it hits. It really simplifies like the strategy around like successful people and why certain people fail. And it's a shortcut if you want it for sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying I'm super successful too, but it is like one of those things that's just like changes your perspective on and how to think a little bit or puts you in check. Like just being like, Hmm, that's how, that's how you have to do it when you're like really, when it's really life and death or something like that's pretty crazy to, to kind of try to relate that to everyday life and, um, yeah, really cool to, to kind of hear that perspective on things. And then I read, you know, I like to read some fun stuff too, or like kind of randomly just switch it up to read some more like fiction style stuff. But yeah, reading's good. It's super good. Yeah. Reading's good. Yeah. Oh. If, you ever, if you ever need a recommendation for a book, hit me up. I'll be happy to, to let you know what I'm reading or whatever for sure. That's awesome. And then another thing, a lot of snowboarders fall and hit their heads. I've spent a ton of money doing cognitive therapy, working on my brain. And one of the things you don't have to spend a ton of money on that I did in cognitive therapy is simply reading and then remembering what you wrote. So like if you want to re help, help your brain out, depending on what part of your brain you hit and what you need to heal. But for me, memory, right? Like, Oh, I'm bad with names or this or that, these things that happen. Right. So a good way to, to, to sharpen your mind is to read like read at night or, and then in the morning, remember what you read and either cognitively, like I'll just say it to my significant other or I'll write it down. But that's, if you can recall that information that you read, you're, you're firing some, your brain on some different cylinders. And it's just a great way to like, you know, we're snowboarders. We've, we've, Let's keep these brains sharp, even though we've smacked our noggins a couple of times. You know, and your brain's yeah. a muscle. The people that don't read a lot, I think, they have that problem. They'll read a whole page and not they're actually somewhere else while they're reading. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're not taking it in. So it's the more you read, the more yeah. you're going to retain that, and that's probably why they have it's you do. A, that. It's like a mental bench press. You yeah. know, instead, of, like it's going to be hard to show up and put up a few hundred pounds if you haven't worked out in six months. But it, uh, slowly incremental gains over time it becomes easier and you can just power through books yep and and even reading three pages a day you look through and you'll be like holy shit I, i'm actually done i never thought you like look through it it breezes by and I'm, I'm not trying to get on my fucking intellectual high horse too much do what you want but no, it's, it's a kind fun of like thing a to talk about quiet time meditation like your time not like scrolling through your phone mm-hmm. wondering what you missed or who's trying to reach out to you or whatever like it's a good kind of relaxing break if you take it that way instead of like oh i gotta read i need to do this work today it's like yeah it can be fun to just kind of take that time to like exercise your brain and for yourself and like yeah that's healthy and we've well, rung our bells plenty of times i'm sure we all have so yeah i think i googled do once what do successful people do and one of them was they read a lot and there's mm-hmm. some guy who was like if you read 10 pages a day in a year you've just read what 30 600 pages yeah. therefore you're taking in more information than this guy next to you which gives you more skills yep. and here you are all of a sudden in the year's time this guy hasn't read anything he's got nothing going and you know about all these different things that nobody else is going to know and it's just 10 pages and, a day and this is a great side conversation about like our our what, what we consume right so like we have if we have a diet i've talked to bitner about this let's say we have a diet and you you eat a double bacon cheeseburger, extra cheese. You're like, you mm. smash that thing. You're like, God damn, that was good. But like, it's from Burger King. And you're like, afterwards, you're like, oh, Jesus. I like 30 minutes later, I feel like shit, right? And let's say you eat a cleaner meal and you're like, okay, it's a salad with maybe some no antibiotic chicken in it or whatever, like some healthier deal, right? You eat that, you're like, oh, I don't, I don't feel as bad. I feel, I don't feel that didn't. So, so you're, you're conscious of like, well, in the same way that we consume like our, our, what we consume in our digital diet is the same. I think it's an interesting thing. Why, why not limit? Okay. Like if I, if I watch the news, the news is just packaging up fear and anxiety. And it's just like, don't go outside today. It's snowed. Like it is very, very dangerous. You do not want to go drive. Like there's traffic, there's accidents. You're like, fuck, I, I should probably not leave my house. Right now. Inversely, if you don't watch the news and you choose to like, read a book, you're going to read that book and you're going to feel great. You just had a little time to reflect. You just learned something. And, and so like, it's like limit limiting your, your, what you consume on a media or 
or intellectual level and being cognizant of that in the same way that you are in your diet. If somebody's a vegetarian, you're like, oh, that guy's a vegetarian. He doesn't eat meat. But if somebody's like, yo, I don't watch the news, you're like, whoa, or I don't, I don't, subs- I don't look at these Instagram far right, far left pages because they make me feel anxious and bad or things of that nature. So it's like you can, you can limit your, your consumption of your, of your digital intake as well. Sorry to be going on a rant about that. But. Dude, there's been a mass yep. shooting every day of the week this week. I, I turned on the news yesterday. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah I have no it's idea. Psycho, dude. It's yeah. crazy. I see. Yeah, I'm, right. I, but I'm happy you're not knowing. What am I yeah. going to do? What am I going to do yeah, with that information? What are you going to do with that? You're not going to leave your house. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to do with that information? Yeah. It doesn't. If it was in my town and I could go help, sure. Yeah. If a hurricane hits my town, I can go help. That's good information. If a hurricane is hitting Florida, it doesn't affect me. Yeah. You don't. Nothing you can do. I'm about sorry. That. Maybe that's <laughs> it. That, but anyway, sorry to go on a rant. And yeah. I heard a funny joke about that today. Not really funny, like making fun of mass shootings at all, but um, around like real estate prices and people moving in and prices going up everywhere. I saw like I can't remember. It was probably on Instagram, but. Somebody sent it in our group text that we have. It was like, when I first moved into my neighborhood, I was freaking out because like I kept hearing a gunshot, gunshots every day. And then I found out it was just my neighbor, and he says he does it. He shoots his gun off a couple times a week just to keep the prices down in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. There yeah, it there, is. See, that's some good. That's some good. Good, <laughs> good content that we can get behind. <laughs> no, I don't know. Not if you don't yeah. want to read, you know what? I watched The Dark Knight recently, and Batman's father says to Batman, "What do we do when we fall down? We get back up." Uh, yep. uh, also, to uh, <laughs> to raise you up on one of the, uh, if you were to talk about uh, Zoolander, I believe the quote is, uh, "What do we do when we fall off the horse?" And the response is, uh, "I don't know, Ari. I'm not a gymnast." <laughs> <laughs> it's a Ben Stiller movie. I think oh it's Zoolander. God. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, fucking movies. That are movie's great. amazing. And do whatever you want. Ben good. Stiller's awesome. Yeah, be another good Hollywood character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Leah's dad would definitely <laughs> looks like. <Ben> Stiller. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. Good stuff. That's amazing. So uh, off the heavy intellectual shmi and uh, whatever. If you want to watch the news or do what you want, and we're ignorant fucks. Right I like to it. stay informed, but not overly informed. Yeah. I don't just let it run all day, but I'll check in at least every few days or something. If I haven't gotten caught up on stuff, it's nice to nice to know what's going on in the world, but I don't want to just let it bombard me all the time. Mm. So, yeah. And it's, lately, it, you don't even know what's all true and what's not. It's just people yeah. pushing their agenda. Yep, exactly. Well, you, you take the information. What are you going to do with the information? If you're gonna if you're gonna go outrage culture and post about it, that doesn't really do anything. Yeah. If you're gonna fit, help out in some way. And yeah, that's good. That's gonna be good. But like, watch the weather, and you know when the next cool day is to do your next podcast. And they're still not even right <laughs> with the weather, man. I know. Shit, I got a good uh, Patreon. That's more of a statement. This is like a sweat lodge in here right now. <laughs> <laughs> I got a Patreon that's more of a statement <laughs> yeah. for you. It's from uh, Hava. <laughs> okay, here we and go. And he says, uh, "You look really <clears throat> great naked." Mm, thank you, Hava. And that's it. Thank you, Hava. Yeah, he's probably referring to uh, your backcountry, the backcountry yeah. commercial we did this year. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> the natural selection, backcountry commercial. Yes, thank you, Hava. That was, uh, that was my uh, winter weight, too. We were, we were looking a little extra warm. <laughs> You're like a full model these days, huh? Uh, not. I mean, when was I not? Zing! <laughs> 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 He's on it. Good answer. Good answer. Uh, yeah, we, we've been doing some fun projects with backcountry and actually yeah, working, working with them a bit, kind of helping them produce... Some more more stuff, more models, stuff like that for different things too. So um, yeah, we're working on some cool projects. We got more coming. Yeah, not me, not me naked. So let's lucky get in, you guys. <laughs> let's talk life after boarding. So you, you segue your long career, killed it, and then went on to work for what brand? How how was that transition from from the pro career into the industry job? Yeah, so following the nothing to prove season where we filmed together a lot, I kind of had to face reality that I wasn't going to make enough money to support myself through snowboarding. Like, you know, I got a house now and a bunch of obligations with that. And, um, snowboarding has changed a lot. I mean, maybe changed for me a lot too. So I'm not bummed on that, but yeah, it was kind of just a reality check where I needed to figure out like what I'm going to do. And am I going to keep chasing this snowboarding thing and, you know, exhaust my savings and, and like even even like that that season, I spent a fair amount of my own money trying to film that part and get that 
get through that season, kind of j- trying to see maybe what would happen. But a lot has changed in snowboarding. It's definitely tougher to get supported and and to you know continue to film, especially video parts. It's a it's a whole new landscape out there now. But I started kind of I got an opportunity to work for Skull Candy and and uh, it was like a six month kind of athlete internship they called it. So I was still an athlete, but they brought me into they brought a few athletes in actually from across different sports and brought us in to work with different teams. And I was mainly on the marketing and brand team and working with like sports marketing was my main thing, which was like, you know, it was pretty, pretty easy fit to kind of learn things, just kind of sitting on the other side of the table kind of as far as like from what I had been doing for so long and got to work with the marketing team, with the partnerships team working on just a bunch of brand brand based kind of cool marketing projects and, and uh, working with the team a lot and helping build a new team. And after six months, not a new team, but adding, you know, always adding and kind of growing. But after six months, they offered me a full-time gig and it was like a cool opportunity. And I I felt like I was learning a lot and I got to work with really smart people and I felt like it was just a, yeah, the right time to transition into doing more of the, you know, the other side of the biz and learn, learn some stuff and learn a new skill, I guess. So yeah, kind of transitioned into that. And I worked at Skull Candy for close to five years, like four and a half years and transitioned out of there, basically got my, you know, the brand and the whole, a lot of things changed over the years. We went from private to public back to private like ownership and tons of turnover with different high high level marketing execs and stuff so kind of had a bunch of different bosses over that time and you know got to learn and learn from really smart people and also work with some people that you know maybe just weren't weren't right for the job or weren't uh had different ideas for how they wanted everything to work and and not aware of what the brand had come from and stuff. But, you know, all in all, it was a great experience and got to learn a lot, got to work with a lot of amazing people and and transitioned out of there right before COVID hit. So, yeah, that was fun. And then fast forward to this year, I've been doing some work with Backcountry, kind of on athlete slash like kind of more like talent side of things, as well as starting to work with them as like kind of a talent liaison and kind of helping source talent that's more authentic not that they don't do authentic stuff but just like you know authentic to the sports we all do different different sports that they that they you know gear that they sell and sports they support and stuff like that so yeah it's been fun it's always fun to kind of work on that and kind of more freelance stuff too so been working on some stuff with like ian rigby as well got to go shoot with ian I got to say, I was the recipient of a cool backcountry.com marketing operation that you, we went and we got to go heliboard. Yeah, uh, that was a commercial. With Powder Birds for Backcountry's commercial and, and it was uh, Bittner snowboarding with the homies and I was in the group with the homies and it was, it was fucking awesome. So I appreciate being a part of that and and it seems like yourself uh, and um John Perry, and I don't know who else is on the team, but it seems like you guys are doing cool stuff over there. And yeah, always got they always got tons going on, tons of things happening always. So a lot to juggle, and those guys, those guys get a lot done in a very small amount of time with a pretty small, pretty small team. So it's really cool to watch watch how how much they do and be a part of some of it. So they had you with Sean White next to you and Sean White <clears throat> up at Natural Selection too. Yeah, yeah, got to. Good things going on. Got to hang with Sean and ride with Sean for a few days. And we did some commentary on the Backcountry YouTube channel for, for Natural Selection. But that wasn't the best best plan. We should have been doing it on IG or something. But mm. um, it was still fun to, to chat with Sean and get his perspective on kind of that contest and how, how much different it was than what he's used to. And I'm kind of coming from the other side of things where I didn't do too many contests, especially like that high level. So... Yeah, it was fun. Well, beautiful. I was wanted <clears throat> to kind of keep talking about some of this this transition of life after boarding, and you you know you're not snowboarding as much, but you picked up a couple new hobbies 
of uh, jujitsu and rock climbing. And I think that, you know, one thing I can speak on myself is like becoming a novice at something again is pretty fun and exciting. Do you share that same sentiment with rock climbing and jujitsu? Yeah, I actually, you know, I kind of climbed when I was younger. I did you like had that. Yeah, kind of like my dad was a little bit into climbing. He got me into it when I was really young. And then I kind of thought it was like kind of like a crunchy hippie thing. Like like we like to make fun of it on here. Same yeah, way. it's easy to make fun of it for sure. It's just different people, a lot of different types of people climb. And it's a, you know, pretty much a free sport once you have all the things you need you can go out and just be in nature and it's pretty hippie if you want to be a hippie about it but it's also yeah something that's really hard and it never gets easier you just start trying harder things and it's like a super fun challenge and I actually started when I was snowboarding because I shattered my right I mean my left collarbone and was doing like a bunch of rehab stuff and kind of getting told by my PT and different people I was working with getting like massage work done and body work done. They're just like, your body's messed up and out of balance. And they're like, what do you do? Like, what do you do for exercise? I'm like, well, I snowboard, I skateboard and I like play golf. Like that's what I do. And I'm not snowboarding basically. And I shovel a lot of snow, which is pretty one sided too. <laughs> but they're telling me, yeah, you need to like do some stuff to kind of balance your body out and then do some upper body stuff to kind of rehab my shoulder. And I did a bunch of workouts and working with a trainer, working with PTs and climbing became one of those things that's like fun to do. It's fun enough to do. And it's a really good workout. It's a perfectly balanced kind of like, like symmetrical workout for your body. And it doesn't feel like you're working out. It feels like more of a mental challenge than just showing up to the gym and like having to go through the motions of like rehabbing something like it's a great gauge for like how strong you are, like being able to climb up something with your, your hands and your arms and your feet. It's, it's pretty cool. I mean, I prefer the, the bench press, but uh, you know, <laughs> well, yep. as, as you know, Chris and I are big supporters of climbing. So. <laughs> $200. Donated yeah, we are to, uh, big SLCA. climbers. So. Yeah, Thank we're you big guys. Climbing. Thank you guys big for that. Supporting. <laughs> SLCA. You can put we'll us on the stoked. board of support. If yeah. there's like a chairman, <laughs> We may need Sony Buds to be the new chairman yeah. of the SLC. I'm so stoked. You guys you guys are real great. <laughs> Send you guys a community. <laughs> <laughs> Huge part of the community. Climbing community. Yeah, we, we might have to get a pair of Tevas as I submit the, uh, <laughs> just put them on, throw a micro puff and some Tevas on. And boom. Uh, don't talk boom. too much shit, dude. Drag you to jiu-jitsu class, too. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that I don't want to do those things because I enjoy talking shit on them. And the minute <laughs> if I do it, I'm going to like it, and I won't be able to talk shit, and that's taken away from me. Yeah, it's taken something You away. can't take that from me. I like having that. Yeah, oh, so let's... Can. And then jiu-jitsu, you just got to beat the shit out of your buddies, and that's got It's going to be fun to know, like, hey, you got a problem? I can fucking destroy you. I can like, choke that, you out. That's fun. Like, I'm, I'm 0-3 in my bar fights. Like, my bar fight record's horrible, you know? If I knew jiu-jitsu, I'd be doing better, right? Uh, you wouldn't get in fights okay. at all. You would just dis <laughs> disarm the fight. You you probably wouldn't even get into that. Well, you know, as we get older, I think you get you kind of learn your lesson a little bit too. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, if you know if you know how to fight and you are aware of like what can happen in a fight, it makes you a little less, a lot less um, apt to want to even get into a. A well, fight with someone you don't know. So true. Like a stranger. Like, what if they have something? Or what if they have really bad intentions and you don't know that they're going to, like, maim you for life or Dude, something? Three it's days way ago, better just to be like, no, I don't want to do any of that. Like, I'm I'm not going to I'm not gonna fight. I'm not, I got no ego. I don't need to, like, stand up for myself if you call me a name or something. Like, I don't care. Like, you go ahead and you can call me whatever name you want. But if, if it turns into something, then, yeah, it's nice to be confident enough to be able to, like, at least get keep yourself safe and get out of a bad situation or help protect one of your friends or something like That's, that. Yeah, but, I like having that three guy. days ago, a 75-year-old dude said like a racial slur to a 22-year-old dude. So the guy punched him, fell back, hit his head in the curb, and died. Another oh, my dude's God. going to jail for life. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Don't fight. Like, fighting stupid. Okay, yeah. now, well, fight people on the mats, and it's super fun. You quite, get to just strangle your friends. Now, <laughs> strangle your friends. <laughs> I'd like to... See if you could defend against my fighting style particularly. So let me paint a picture of my fighting style, and I want to see how you'd approach. So normally what I like to do is murder, and, and 
this is this is in the rear view. <laughs> murder, uh, I'll the murder. Rear view. <laughs> I'll murder about uh, thirty beers. I'll say something like that. Uh, take a few shots of liquor to where I'm basically cross-eyed, just completely pie-eyed. Um, <laughs> having a hard time stringing a sentence together. <laughs> like we're talking like blacked out, browned out, somewhere in that vicinity. Like just an absolute mess. Now something will happen, and my technique is I like to do like a haymaker where I start from maybe five feet back and kind of get like a slow drunken stumble and just swing from the fences. And I think I'm going like full Jason Bourne on him, but it's more of like a <laughs> slow motion kind of just like drunken Neanderthal. Now, what's your technique to defend against that? Just asking for a friend out of curiosity. I mean, <laughs> asking for a friend. <laughs> have you seen the reach on this guy? Yeah. I have, yeah. I see, I see him at the gym. He's he would, a, the kid's a problem. He would take you out from way back in the face. I wouldn't punch you. I'd probably just step out of the way. Oh, you would? Okay. <laughs> yeah, let right. him trip over his feet. Uh, yeah. That's a classic move. I've seen that one. You're going to off-balance yourself enough just by swinging that hard. You're going to yeah. take yourself out. <laughs> so, Jin, it, it, uh, it teaches you all to just be zen about it, huh? No, but it teaches you, like... It's not worth it. First of all, no matter how tough you think you are, at least for me, I when I went into my first class, this is kind of how it happened, really. It was like... Being bored one summer, I, I I like I've always been into watching like UFC fights and stuff. So I've been aware of jujitsu for a long time, and I trained like sporadic martial arts when I was younger, like a little bit of like taekwondo classes for a few weeks, and did aikido for a little bit. But I was when I was like pretty young though, and didn't really have the discipline to keep going karate classes. But had some friends that were gonna start. We had we knew one guy that actually trained and had some friends or a friend, Tom Lee, who wanted to try it. He's like, we can go to this class with, with our buddy Ron. And I was like, okay, like, I'm not doing anything tonight. Like, I got no excuse. I could say I'll go, and I don't go, or whatever. So I was just like, I'll, I'll just go. Try it out. I used to wrestle in, in, like, junior high. I feel like I can handle myself well enough. And I just got not even destroyed. Like, if you have expectations that you're going to do pretty good i got like humiliated like mm. i was just like <clears throat> i can't do anything with these like <laughs> like smaller people than me and like a girl like got handled just like completely handled like not even like not even like getting my ass kicked and like getting destroyed i just got completely shut down and like handled like there's nothing i can do i felt like this is just a like a superpower you could have you know it's like a it's like knowing how to having that much awareness of your own body and then how to off balance and deal with somebody else it's really it is like a really gentle way to like deal with somebody that's trying to hurt you or just to, to train really hard with people like you get to train at at like nearly a hundred percent with people not like boxing or sparring with like kickboxing or any sort of other stand-up striking art Jiu-jitsu is all grappling, so you can you can basically be trying 100% and completely get a gnarly workout, sweat your ass off, get completely destroyed in a class, and not feel like you just got your ass kicked. Like you, you feel like I just had a great time. I learned some stuff about myself. I learned about how to like fight with somebody on the ground, but kind of every fight goes to the ground and. And, you know, getting back to, like, self-defense type stuff. There's all sorts of stuff you can learn there that we are forced, not forced, but that's kind of a big part of the curriculum. You need to know when you get higher in the belt levels, at least, you need to know how to handle yourself in, like, a bar fight. If you, get, if you do get taken down, then it's kind of a, an embarrassment to, to get completely handled mm -hmm. if you're highly trained in something, so need to know what you're doing but when we train it's like yeah we're trying to strangle each other or get somebody to give up that's the coolest thing when you think about that you're not winning the fight like literally that person is quitting they say i give up you you win like you got me it's, it's a like, mission huh yeah yeah that's i mean dude i think i could see getting into jiu-jitsu makes a lot of sense it's a good thing to know how to do good thing to be able to defend yourself and the only experience i have with my like my brother and i we fight like i see my brother he's always he'll like spray me with the hose for no reason and I'll just like tackle him and then we're two adults fighting that don't know how to fight and it's like <laughs> it's ex dude it, there's nothing more exhausting than, yeah, than trying to hurt someone? somebody like <laughs> yeah. dude it, there isn't there I don't think there's a single thing that's more exhausting like I'm uh, you know my brother's like we're out of shape like we don't know what we're doing it's like 
bunch of monkeys trying to hump a basket, <laughs> like basketballs. Just like it's a disaster. It's a fucking disaster. But I am spent afterwards, dude. It's like a whole like I yeah. can only imagine two people that are actually know what they're doing and how exhausting that would be. Well, no, it teaches you to stay calm and stay like be comfortable in uncomfortable positions and mm -hmm. survive, not just like be like, I got to win. I'm I'm tough. I got to win. It's more like teaching you how to stay calm and survive until you can kind of find a little opening to get get some space and move out of a bad situation or kind of keep keep that space tight on somebody else so they don't get out and trying to close the distance and kind of better your position until you get to a submission or something. So yeah, it's a really fun, humbling thing you can do with yourself and with your body. And there's yeah, nothing like that really. Like you just go train with all sorts of different people from all different walks of life. Like even training at the sect, there's a bunch of guys that come in and train in there. And it's like, yeah, everybody kind of has different backgrounds, but you get in there and get on the mats or you get in the gym and start working out. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from or whatever. You're all just like in there to help get each, get better. Totally. And there's definitely some type of bond, be it, uh, whether any, any type of mutual suffering that you do with somebody else, whether it's manual labor and you're doing a job that sucks or it's in the gym going hard or snowboarding in the back country and your shit breaks down or there's, you know, you can go on forever about, but there, there's so many good bonds that are always formed from, being uncomfortable with another human in a situation, you know? Absolutely. And yeah, huge bonds. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> like, shit hits the fan in another country. Like, yeah. Buds and I, you know, we've yeah. been all, all over. Just, and it's like... Yeah, it makes you bond, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's plenty awesome. of that. That's how you make your best friendships. Yeah, best, true. Best memories, really, when shit goes wrong, as long as you're with someone you trust to keep their shit together with yeah. you. Yeah, it's, it's nothing worse time. than someone panics when it goes wrong. Yeah, some of the Some most interesting do. trips, though, are the ones that don't go according to plan. Yeah, exactly. Or if you're with someone that can't handle things when they go awry, then that's real tough to deal with, too. Yeah. But usually nothing works out the way you expect it to. Yeah, it never <laughs> does, right? <laughs> okay, I almost forgot. We got another treat, and this is a question from uh, an absolute legend. It goes by the name of Jeremy Jones. Um, here we go. The question. Let's get to the question. What would... You say, that's what I'm looking for. If we get the bitner back on the blades. What was your best trick, doggy? Peace. Love ya. <laughs> <laughs> so to give you a preference, uh, or sorry, to give you a reference, he was, he was in his garage holding up a rollerblade there in the video and... Uh, he also rambled for about uh, a minute and a half about how you have great style and all these things, but I kind of uh, trimmed it down to get right to the question. So he was, anyway, the question's about uh, rollerblading. Yeah, that's a that's my secret, actually. That's how I got my start. I started hitting handrails on my blades when I was like, yeah, probably 16 to like 18. We'd blade a lot. You were good. Rollerbladed a lot, yeah. Learned how to hit rails on blades first, so step into rails on a snowboard. Didn't seem quite as, as sketchy as maybe it could for other people. But, yeah, the blades were a big part of my life. Not, not ashamed to say that at all. And I'll get back on them any time, especially if Jeremy wants to go blade. Dude, we you know, we should we should have gone blading. <laughs> we should have gone blading. That would have been fun. Oh, I saw you could, like a couple could. years ago at the Skull Candy ramp. Yeah, Killing I borrowed, a pair, I yeah, borrowed someone's blades it. and got some grinds. You got back to my best grind, I guess. Uh, oh, the names are beautiful. I love the yeah. names. <laughs> Good, good old fish brain. Fish brain. Yep. What about a farfanugan, or is that bikes? Farfanugan is a is a trick on blades or a torque. It's oh, a like, torque. Okay. What's a fish brain? Fish brain is like one foot on on top. Like it's like you get your wheels on top of the rail or the or the ledge, and it's just your one foot kind of on the sole of your skate, kind of on the side of it. It's such like a, there's not that many people doing it, so you can name these things whatever you want. That'd be cool to be able to pioneer the names. What what other names we got? We got any other good names um, for grinds? Another good name. There's like a porn star. Oh, porn. I remember that one. Yeah. Porn star or alley-oop porn star. Um, what about when you cross your legs up? A Unity or a Savannah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Savannah. <laughs> yeah, but Savannah is where, you're, where you're, your front leg is over the top of your back foot crossed over. And then, and why Savannah? No, no nobody, idea. Nobody knows. Maybe it was invented in Savannah, Georgia. All right, something. Who knows? 
Good and guess. a unity is like the back foot over the top of your front foot, kind of feet crossed up, sliding between your wheels. A royale is just like both skates kind of leaned over, sliding like this way between your wheels. Yeah, Royale's a, a classic. Trick, trick Royale's is. the classic. There's yeah. a lot to remember if you're a rollerblader, man. These are crazy names. <laughs> yeah, I haven't thought about rollerblading. What about you ever get well. sacked? You can get so savage, <laughs> savagely sacked on the blades, right? Yeah, I, I don't think. Yeah, I probably hit my nuts too, but f- like fell on my tailbone or like your butthole. You split a rail, same as skating, like skateboarding. Mm-hmm. Split a rail, you hit your butthole really hard, and then get pitched forward. More so in the taint, huh? Yeah, yeah. and your. Your blades roll, so that kind of can either be good or bad as you're coming off of something. Uh, and they're heavy. They're heavier for sure than just shoes. So, yeah, you take some good bales on the blades. That's okay. a young man's sport, too. It's a young man's sport. <laughs> um, going back. Not to young man, young person's sport. Young person's mm-hmm. sport. Mm-hmm. So, uh, going back to the blades, I heard a little uh, secret as to why you're so good at Switch 50s. Yep, my... My rollerblade side, like I do my royales or like front sides. A front side is like both feet just kind of like spread apart between your wheels. It's easy to balance. Kind of like a ski slide. Like the way skiers slide is like kind of like a front side or like a lip slide. It was like, or back side would be like jump on something backside. And yeah, I slide right foot forward on my rollerblades. So that was like my natural. And then, yeah, snowboarding. I've been regular, so. Had to learn 50s the other way, but switch 50s worked all right. That's Probably awesome. because of rollerblading. <laughs> <laughs> and coming off rails and stairs, I was too used to that. So I also always, when I was warming up to hit rails on my board, I'd always just come off in the stairs a little bit because it's, for me, it, I'd prefer to know what it feels like to come off in the stairs before I come off out of control. I'd rather come off in control first and know if the stairs are going to be sticky or not so I know what I'm dealing with. That makes sense. Now, I have a question. Have you ever seen 666 Roy Blade Rail on YouTube by chance? I don't know. Is that like the longest rail ever done? Oh, yeah, I've seen this. I haven't. Chris Haffey's a legend, too. Yeah, watch this video. Oh, is this a fo- This isn't it. Is it? Oh, this yeah, is it. Yeah, it is it. Yeah, this is it. Watch this thing. He's on this rail for like it's two like, minutes. Yeah, five minutes long or something. Dude, he's just, look at this guy. 666 yeah. Roy Blade Rail. <laughs> that trick's just called a front side, but he just holds that <laughs> just forever. Waving. Dude, <laughs> well, have you ever? You he's think, still going. Huh? Uh, homeboy's for walking listeners. back up. <laughs> yeah, he's been on this rail for a hot minute here. Oh my god, that thing is so How long. Much? So uh, also, uh, I'm guessing there's copious amounts of wax on. I noticed the bladers yes. love the wax. He's can you talk about? Wax. Can we talk about why the bladers love the wax? Or so you can go slow, wow. jump on something, and slide forever. I can see why that guy's a legend. Yeah, he's. a He's done some crazy shit. That's like the longest rail ever done in any sport, I'd imagine. That thing's and it curves. Yeah, and massive. Yeah, and we it, love the wax. We'd go to Sandy Park and... Oh, you kinda, wax the rails to go slower on them. Yeah, and you're you're not like... Gives you more control. Not, not necessarily just going it's, slower at the rails, but it's nice to just slide smooth and not get caught up. And it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, different than on a skateboard where you kind of do need to go pretty fast and like grind it. Mm-hmm. Or like slide, like board slide or something where you can like push, you kind of push your board along. Like rollerblading, you kind of like are like pinching the rail or like kind of using it to like lock into it. So once you lock in, your skate is like pinching or your wheels are pinching a little bit. So you need a lot of wax. Skate you must, hated that. You must have experienced extreme amounts of uh, bullying when people found out that you bladed because that's an easy, that's like a thing people bully. We gave him a little shit at Tech Nine for sure <laughs> yeah. when we found out. But he's, yeah. he like it was proud of it. There was no like, we, there's how no did you, bullying him because he you, was just like, yeah, whatever. How I'm did stoked. you? Uh, how did you divert these haters? Is what I want to know. I mean, you can hate on it all you want. That's your problem, not he mine. He didn't care. <laughs> yeah. Wow, look That's at this how guy. He deflected it. That's a good deflection. That's like Louis Vito dodging yeah. when you ask him about cheddar biscuits. It doesn't make very much fun making fun of him. He's too good. Yeah, he it doesn't care. get under his skin. Yeah, it doesn't. He doesn't care one bit. Yeah, I mean, it's not something I'm ashamed of. If I was ashamed of it and I felt like it was a big secret, I didn't want you guys to know. Then I'd be like, oh man, where'd you hear that? But yeah, it's it's always been something like just doing it. I knew for sure it's gonna get some heat, or of course, people that skateboard or like. People at Milo, of course, are going to talk shit. People that are diehard skaters and snowboarders Did and shit. Did you skate, like, too, at the time? Yeah. Yeah, I've always I skateboarded both. since I was really young, too. But yeah. had a big crew of, like, good friends that all rollerbladed or kind of all kind of switched over to rollerblading a lot more. And so we'd just go out and meet up and go skate, and it was fun. 
Uh, I got to take. We go street skate and hit rails and stuff, and then we'd meet up at the skate park and skate the park with a big crew. Like it was a, it was a super fun, super fun time, and just a different thing than just like I don't know. It's easier than skateboarding too, so it's something you can kind of progress at and do bigger things on without like potentially really getting fucked up. Like, yeah, both both ways you can, but skateboarding is just hard. Like I hurt, rolled my ankles tons and. Would hurt myself it's to like the, the point where like I was taken do. out for a while. Yeah, skateboarding's fucking hard. Like, <laughs> like it's super fun, and would I love like still love skating, but it's fucking hard. And I've okay. hurt myself enough skating to where like almost took myself out at the start of a season a few times because I'm like skating a ton, and then I just roll my ankle super bad, and I'm like shit, I got to go snowboard in like the next month, and I can't even walk. <laughs> so, uh, I've got a take up thing. I've said this before, but going back to blading, I mean, I. I back blade. If you're going to, I'm big pro blading over here because you look at like, sure. Maybe in like the nineties or something like you could kind of talk shit on, on rollerblading a little bit or something like it was, but nowadays you go to the park, it is a lost art. When I see like a couple of bladers come out of the woodwork, I'm like, damn dog. Like you guys are still doing it. It's oh, is like, it a lost art. It's a lost art, man. And and then you see the, the real problem is like the the bladers are respectful they their heads up they look where they're going they know where they're at the park they understand etiquette they've been around if you're blading chances are you've been around the scene for a long time now the the real problem is the scooters because they just there's no etiquette it's a whole different breed of human in the scooters so those are kind of who I mean and and maybe there's some I know you know my my neighbor up that lives up the street. He's a scooter kid. He's cool as shit. There's some dope scooter guys out there. Don't get me wrong, but for the most part, there's a lot of young kids that are that are like the blades. Blades are all good. They're green light. It's the it's the scoots scooters that you got to watch. Out. Scooters yeah. are an absolute problem. Yeah. I've seen or BMX that. bikes too. Like kid, the like silent killers. When BMX bikes come out, you gotta be. You gotta always be like, whether you're rollerblading or skating or on a scooter. That's like the. The like death machine in the skate park. If you don't always know where those guys are at before you drop in, like you're rolling the dice. If you run into a bike, that's they a, remove the brakes from the bicycle. I noticed that's a that's a thing they do. They remove mm-hmm. the brakes. They remove the brakes from the bicycle. I, I don't. So they can't even stop if they want. Yeah, to. you got a freight train that you can't even hear coming at you. You know, mm-hmm. silent killer. But that's uh, you know, that's that's my gripe. But they also, I kind of, I don't got much of a problem with it, except for the guys. Yeah, there's there's some there's some bikes that can be. I didn't know they removed the brakes. Yeah, you go to the park, nobody's got brakes on their bikes. It's like yeah, I'm not hating on any of that. I just think bikes are for sure what to watch out for if you don't want to get in a bad collision. Yeah, it's gonna hurt. Rollerblades, you might you might go skate up to a curb that you've been or a ledge you've been skating or a rail and realize it's been waxed all to That's shit. That's your main issue. That's your big it. issue. <laughs> your coping's gonna be a little faster than you're used to. Yeah. Skateboards, you got skateboards flying out from under people or flying around the park. Yeah. Um, there's all, yeah. You just got to pay attention. Going to a skate park, you're, you're rolling the dice a little bit. You are. Okay. But whatever you have fun doing, man. That's great. That's a great mantra there. Now, I think uh, we can get ready to start uh, getting this thing across the finish line here. Before we do, uh, we always like to ask if you would like to take this time to thank anybody. Huge thanks to everybody that supported me over the years. Huge thanks to all all my sponsors I've worked with and everybody I've had the opportunity to cross paths with with over the years. You know, like everybody that's helped me out and supported me in general. Big thanks and uh, yeah, I mean, tons of love. Beautiful. Tons of love. Passion for snowboarding. That's amazing. You guys are doing this too. Like huge shout out to you guys and all the hard work you put in here, sitting in the sauna. <laughs> it's an ice box in the winter, so yeah. in the summer, so it kind of depends. But thank you. No, it's Appreciate a great, it. great little spot you got here, and you guys have you guys have been killing it. So, I'm a big awesome. fan of the show, and it's and it's, it's a true honor to be here for sure. So, thank Still you. To have you it means a lot. Now, two quick things before we get out of here. Uh, I got to ask because it's a debatable subject. I don't know how it hasn't come up on the show yet, but there's a there's a debate over high backs behind the pants and in front of the pants. Now, I noticed early in your career you were avid uh, high backs. Snowboard pants over the high backs of your bindings. Uh, talk about why and your stance on that. Yeah, I think it was a style thing to have them over the over the high backs. It was kind of just the style at the time. Or like sometimes we'd ride with like one over your front foot and like one behind the binding on your back foot. And I started to notice I'd get caught up a little bit riding pow, especially or doing like a heel side traverse or something. I'd get my pants caught up where they'd kind of kind of slip under my heel and 
caused some issues there. So for me, it was more of a functionality thing to tuck my high, tuck my pants in my high backs, just started getting it out of the way. But, um, I think it looks cool either way too. It looks old school when it's over. It is old school. Over Absolutely. the high backs for sure. So, I mean, back in the day, that's how we all rocked it. But it's a, an extra thing to do when you strap into, you got to lift your pants up, get everything set, pull them down over everything. So you got to do that when you're tucking them too, but. Yeah, I don't know. There's a couple I just people who don't ride it. with high backs. Mike Ranquette. Yeah. No high backs. Yep. Jake O.E. Jake O.E. Jake O.E. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think those are the only two, though. So it, looks, it looks like their high backs are tucked. <laughs> yeah, so it looks like they're tucked, I seen, but uh, no uh-huh. high backs. Frank, Frank April went like, he went from the tuck to the no tuck. And I, I got to crisis almost? I, I got to like say that, like, out. back on the East, our gen, we were, we were kind of, I mean, Bender got the pass because he had good style, but we were, we were hating on the high backs. You're keeping those things cloaked. You want to let those things out. You want to let them bark. You want to let them shine. You mm-hmm. know. Well, we, then the tight pant kids, they can't even do it. It's they don't have even, an option. They have no yeah, they option. Don't have an option. But yeah. I, you know, if it's me, I'm saying let let the high backs get them some shine. They they look better. It looks better. It's a better looking operation. How about how about keeping your pants rolled up above your boots? I would steer clear that at all yeah. costs. At all costs. <laughs> I would steer clear that at all costs. That's I've heard your sense. opinions on that before, for yeah. sure. You guys have probably <laughs> mentioned that a couple times. The only well. time you'll catch me with the shit over my boots is when I'm out shooting photos, and I get out of the van late, and I'm panicked, and uh, the session's going on, and I totally forget to roll them down. He's wearing yeah. Sorrells, though. It's not like yeah, I'm wearing Sorrells, and I run out there, and then I get a bunch of snow in my Sorrells, and I'm ruined for the whole trip. Yeah, not going to lie. I do that, too. I yeah. just keep, keep them rolled up until it's, like, time to actually do something or yeah, maybe okay. the camera's coming out. But, um, yeah. I think it's a weird it's look a, to shred like that. Personally. It's not too functional. <laughs> yeah. And no, no matter what, I think all across the board we can agree that the – when the pants go over the top of the boot, it's just a better look. Yeah. Let's just be, let's just, that's, that's just kind of, it's, it's. We it's, used to keep our pants above our rollerblades, if that helps uh, uh. convince anyone to pull them, pull them down over their boots. <laughs> 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 I like that. Uh, okay. And then one other thing that I found uh, to be fascinating is that when we asked you on the Patreon interview, we asked you um, best advice you've ever received and you had a fantastic answer. I think what we said was like basically the best advice for me is just take a deep breath. Like take a deep breath. If you're going through something great or something bad, take a deep breath. This too shall pass. It kind of goes into that type of thing. Like don't get too caught up on anything. Kind of enjoy, enjoy it while it lasts. And, and, um, if it's, if you're going through something, something shitty, that's also not going to last forever. So nothing lasts forever. Take a deep breath and enjoy it. I love that. If you're struggling and you're having a hard time, this too shall pass. You're going to get through it. I love that. There's that famous quote, if you're going through hell, keep going. Yeah, Winston Mm -hmm. Churchill. Exactly. Yeah. That's beautiful. Well, I want to say thank you, Bittner, for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you, guys. uh, Arabian sauna that we are in right now, and uh, thank it's not you. even bad yet. It's, it's not gonna even get that bad, bad next yet. Week. It's gonna get real bad. Yeah, the the sweat lodge. I think AKA next episode booth. I'm gonna bring a cooler and just stick my feet in, oh, fill yeah. it with ice, ice bucket. Yeah, and just oh, I like stick that. my feet in there barefoot. Okay, That's a good idea. Just sitting on ice. I'm gonna have to do that at home. My house probably feels yeah, like you're this. You kind of need to do that tonight. I was yeah. thinking cooler with the ice pack behind. That's what I was going through my head as we were talking. That's let's, a good move. Oh, yeah. Or, not, or uh, fan, fan with the ice oh, block. That's what I meant to say. Ice fan block. Ice block. Yeah. That's the ghetto AC right there. The ghetto there. AC. So, uh, all right. Well, we're gonna get out of here. Thank you guys so much for listening and watching each and every week. We really appreciate you guys. You guys kick ass, and we will see you next Wednesday. Over and out from the bomb hole.